It's time to go live, and we are live. Hi, everybody. It is today's 2201101A Plus study group. This is our pre show where I am checking all of my recordings. I'm making sure everything's getting running. We'll probably get started here in about nine minutes. Hello, chat room. Hello, everybody. Hi, thanks for being here. Just trying to, oh, we need stream helped up. That looks good. These are all good. I think we need to put this over here. That looks excellent. Hello, chat room. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Boy, it's been it's been a month, hasn't it? It's been more than a month. It's been two months since I did one of these. So November was our, was that our bi month? What do we call it? Just we didn't do anything in November. There were no live streams in November, but now there are live streams here. So we can do this here. Thanks for being here, everybody. Hey, Malk from St. Vincent. Thanks for, thanks for hanging out. We appreciate you being here. There's a lot going on here. I'm just trying to get all of my ducks in a row. It is, uh, it's very busy here. What's going on? Yeah, it's been since Halloween. So now we're, we're into the, the December holidays now. Oh, I, I miss these streams too. Uh, thanks for being here. Yes, thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. We've got a lot going on today. I've got to, uh, I've got all new questions, of course. Uh, I'm making sure everything is running the way I would hope it to be. And it does appear that it is. Try not to touch too many things. One of the challenges whenever I'm working through all of these, these different machines that we have here is I don't like to make any changes because I never know how things are going to go after doing that. Um, so we make very few changes at a time. And we keep doing these. These streams are done, you know, once a month, I guess, is the good way. So uh, that's that's how it would be. Hello, Arnold. I uh, haven't done the A-plus, passed the Network Plus, Security Plus. Want to ask a question at the end? Absolutely, please do. We will we will talk all about, the in the second hour, any questions that you might have. So we can always do that. Yeah, this this <laughs> this desk setup is a little bit uh, is a little bit over the top, I must admit. But everything has a purpose, so I'm trying to make sure everything is is working the way one it would expect it to work. So we'll figure it out. Uh, the next study groups and all the study groups can be found at professormesser.com slash calendar. It's a great place to go. Uh, net, uh, the next A plus study group is Thursday. The network plus study group is a week from tomorrow. So we got a lot going on there. So there's always something. Um, let's get rid of this. We'll go live. This is not the show. For those of you get, getting here for the first time, this is not the live stream, really. It's the pre-show. So I'm making sure that all of my monitors, all of these mini monitors in front of me are working the way I would expect them to work. Let's make sure our laptop is up and running. It is. Um, so we got we got plenty to do. There's also an events channel in our Discord. You can go to the events channel as well. It will tell you when the next event is going to be. The 1102 study group is on Thursday. So come back on Thursday. Same time, same place. Just hang out here. We got about four and a half, five and a half minutes before we get started on the actual live stream. You'll see me like this. So thankfully, there will be an actual camera on me. It's not the back of my head the whole time. It's not, it's, it's not, I'm not, I'm not like those folks on YouTube who never, never show their face. Unfortunately, you're stuck having to look at my face. Sorry about that. So I, although I could be, maybe I am one of the people on YouTube that doesn't show their face so that I can show my face. No, that, that isn't it either. So it doesn't work that way. So we'll figure it out. Uh, we got a lot going on uh, with the study groups. You know, December is just a busy month in general. So I've got study group content up. We've got a lot going on. Uh, here, here is our very first and uh, ongoing question. Am I planning on doing practice exams for the N10008? Well, I am planning, yes to create practice exams. When will that happen? Hmm, I don't know. When will that happen? It's a mystery to all of us, really. Uh, my goal is the, that in the, in the coming months, I won't, that's about as, as detailed as I can give you. In the coming months, you will be able to uh, determine or see when, when the, um, the book will finally be done. I hope. That's the goal. But it might, it might not. I'm I'm not locking it in, but I would, I'm really, really interested in getting that book finished. 
uh, which implies that I've already started. Yes, I have. I have already started that book. But it's it's a big book. It takes months to get those books written. Because the, the questions have to be just right. The answers have to be just right. I have to edit it in a certain way. It's it's all good in that. Uh, somebody asked on Discord, the learning objectives are the correct version, either 4.0 or 6.0. There's very little difference between the different versions of the exam objectives document. Just go download the latest version from the CompTIA website, and you'll have the latest one. Uh, you'll notice the differences between 4.0 and 6.0 are probably some misspellings. Maybe they added or changed some of the things that were in the the uh, the the back or the front. They they change a few other things, but nothing very dramatic. I mean, you could be using the 1.0 version and you'd still be fine. So there's very little difference there, fortunately. Now, if they make a dramatic difference, they very rarely make dramatic differences once the exam objectives are released. So they're very good at not mixing it up. These are usually minor fixes, uh, problems in the, the typos they might have, things like that are good. Wow. Trey coming right off the top rope. Trey with the super chat, $50 super chat. I passed my 1000, 1002 exam almost exclusively from your material. You the man. Well, considering you passed both of those, uh, you are the one who did all the hard work. So congratulations on your A plus certification. Thank you also for the super chat. We sure do appreciate that. That is that's one of the few things here that I I never ask for um, these super chats. I have it there as an option, uh, but it really does go back to keeping all of these live events and other things going. So I sure appreciate that. Thank you so much, and congratulations on your A plus. What's next? That's what we want to know. Now that you got the A plus in your pocket. Are you going to get a job? Are you going to get another cert? Are you going to do another thing? We need to know. We're very interested. Am I going to do take 10 challenges for the 1101, 1102? I should. That would be nice if I was if I was to do that. I just haven't done it yet. Um, the, the plan is to do that. Is the plan going to work out? I don't know. I want to thank also Discipline, uh, who has a $1.99 super chat. No, no, nothing there. Nothing to say. Just saying, hey. Here's a couple bucks. Keep the lights on. We sure appreciate it. That's uh, that's very nice of you. Thank you. Well, we got a minute and a half left. I should probably set up my screens here for the live stream. We need to bring the chat over to the other window, uh, um, like so. I don't know if that's going to work. We'll get it. Um, so we'll get that. Uh, lots of good questions coming in, though. Oh, I did a very bad job with the lower third there, though, didn't I? Nope, not working it right. Work it work it better. Uh, we will. Let's see if I can change some of these brightnesses. Ooh, didn't realize once I turn the lights out that it will be super bright. So I'm going to adjust a few things on my screen. Ah, much better. I probably didn't even look any different from your side, did it? But it did look different on my side. Uh, is security more in demand or cloud? I would say both of those are pretty much in demand. I don't think you can go wrong with that. That's what I would I would tell you. Um, the, the problem, of course, with both security and cloud is you kind of have to work up to it. You kind of need a baseline foundational knowledge in operating systems and networking. And that pretty much get, gets you where you can kind of jump into the cloud-based services. Okay, well, it's top of the hour coming up. Let's start our presentation here. Beautiful green light. Let's change some camera angles here. And, oh, is this going to work? We're about to find out, everybody. Let's do a live stream. Here we go. Uh, we're going to start it uh, maybe right now. Let's see if we can get this done. Here we go, everybody. Hello, everyone. My name is Professor Messer, and welcome to our December 2022 Professor Messer 2201101A Plus Study Group. This is a monthly study group where I ask you questions that come directly from the CompT exam objectives, and hopefully you're able to answer some of these questions. In this first hour, I'll be asking you the questions, so stick around as we go through all of these. We're going to dive in and go very deep into the questions I'll be answering. And then in the second hour, I open up the chat room. We'll take questions from there. We already had a number of good questions in the pre-show, and we'll, we'll probably do some other questions coming in 
as well. There are ways that you can participate here if you are watching this live. Obviously, this doesn't work very well if you're on the replay. But if you are here live, there are some things you can do to be able to participate. Just follow along with us. You can open a new browser window, open up that new tab, and go to professormesser.com slash QA. There'll be a question waiting for you when you get there. There is also an app you can get for this. It is the Socrative Student app. You can get it on your favorite app store, and you can, of course, open that up. It will ask you for a room name, so the little extra work you have to do if you have the app. That extra work is to put in the room name of Professor Messer, all one word, P-R-O-F-E-S-S-O-R-M-E-S-S-E-R, -S -S -E and that will get you where you need to go. If you do all of that, there will be a question waiting for you. We call this our rewind question, but it is a question that we did on the last study group and I want to see how well we do in this study group. That, that question asks, which of the following would prevent someone from inadvertently viewing sensitive information on a printer output tray? Is it, see all the different options, WPA3, duplexing, audit logs, printer sharing, or badging? Lock in your answer by going to professormesser.com slash QA. That's where you want to go. Pop open that new browser tab. Visit that URL and lock in your answer. If you're watching this on the replay, there's no browser tab for you to open. You can just follow along with what we're doing. Don't answer in the chat room. That's our only rule is please no answers in the chat room. And instead, we will come back to this question in just a bit to see how well you know this question. We'll, we'll, we'll revisit it and see if we can remember either what we did last month or Maybe you, you actually know the answer to this question. We'll figure it out. Thanks for being here on a live stream. We cannot uh, do this without you. Well, I guess we could do this without you, but it would be pretty boring. So thank you for being here and supporting what we do. When we're not doing a live stream, you can always follow us online. Go to professormesser.com slash YouTube slash Twitter slash Instagram slash LinkedIn slash wherever it is that you think you should be able to find me slash Discord. I should probably put that one on here too, although I have another another slide that kind of mentions those, but that's a great way to keep up with what we're doing here. And there's always something interesting going on. Also, keep listening in sometime during this first hour. I will give you uh, information on how you can earn one hour of a webinar category CEU. Now, if you don't know what a webinar category CEU is, then this probably doesn't apply to you. But if you've already earned one of your CompTIA certifications, you can help use these, these uh, continuing education units or CEUs to renew your certifications, one of the many ways that you can use to renew. So listen up sometime in this first hour, and I'll tell you about how all of that works once we get into it. Well, there is now two exams. If you recall, in our last study group in October, there were two editions, two versions of the CompTIA A plus exams that you could take. But of course, as many of you know, on October the 20th, the older version was retired. That means now, there's only a single version of the A-plus certification that you should be studying. That is the 220-1101 and the 220-1102. These were released in April of this year, which means that we'll probably retire these exams in October of 2025. Now, that, of course, means you've got plenty of time before you ever have to worry about these exams retiring. If you're listening right now in December of 2022, I think you're you're doing just fine. These exams, there are two separate exams. Both exams are 90 minutes for each one of them. The 220-1101, you need to earn a 675 score and a scale from 100 to 900. On the 1102, you need to do a little bit better. You need to earn a 700 on that exam on the same scale between 100 and 900. And once you get certified, your certification is good for three years until you have to renew that certification. So if you're thinking about timing. Should I do this? Absolutely, you should do this. You've got three years from the moment you certify to say that you indeed are A-plus certified. And it's it's relatively easy to renew this even after that three-year period. It's maybe a good investment in your career. There may be employers looking for this certification. It's a great way to get into information technology. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about the 220-1101, the Core 1 exam. The topics we will discuss today and the topics and questions I have deal with mobile devices, networking, hardware, virtualization and cloud computing, and hardware and network troubleshooting. So we've got a few of these that we'll talk about. Come back on Thursday when we do our 1102 
uh, study group, we'll do operating system security, software troubleshooting, and operational procedures. That's on Thursday, two days from now. We'll do another live stream at exactly the same time. You can come back for that one as well. We've also got a video replay of this available immediately afterwards on YouTube. There's also a audio-only version of this in podcast format you can find in professormesser.com slash podcast. It's a great way to have this always show up on your podcast listening program. And there are links there to join the 2A Plus study groups, the Network Plus study group, and the Security Plus study group, all from professormesser.com slash podcast. There is also, if you go about a day later, you'll notice on our YouTube video description are different timestamps for everything we do in this study group. It makes it very, very quick for you to be able to find exactly what you're looking for. And the way we're able to provide those is because my marketing manager, Lori, is watching this on the replay. Hi, Lori. Probably watching this at 2x speed, getting all of the timestamps put into this, making sure that she finds all of the things that we are looking for there. And she puts all of this in here so you can find it. So you can go back years through these, these study groups and you'll find timestamps to take you exactly to where you need to find the information. So a very good way to hunt down exactly what you might need even after the fact. And if that doesn't answer your questions, you can always join us live in our chat. Follow us at professormaster.com slash discord where you can join our discord channel. And then absolutely, we will... Do our best to answer whatever questions you might have. Uh, we're usually in there. We're not doing a live stream. We're usually in there uh, talking about uh, everything from A-plus technology and then things that may not have anything to do with technology. It's a great, great place to hang out. There's a really nice community there. That's at professormesser.com slash discord. Also let you know that eventually you're going to need to take your A-plus certification exam. One of the best ways to do that is to get a voucher. And if the voucher is even discounted and you can save a little bit of money, that would be great. So don't pay full price on the CompTIA website. You can instead go to professormaster.com slash vouchers if you're in the U.S. and Canada and you're able to get a discounted voucher. You don't need a coupon code. You don't need some type of special uh, thing to plug into your browser. I've never really understood a lot of those, but it is one that uh, is already discounted. So that, that makes it very, very easy. You don't have to play any games to get the, the discount on these. And if you purchase a voucher from my site, I even go a little bit further and give you a free copy of my Exam Hacks ebook. This is a book I wrote with some tips and tricks that I have learned through the years taking so many different IT certification exams. I've probably taken 25 different IT certification exams at this point. Uh, and every time, I tend to learn a little bit more about the process, about the procedures, about some tips and tricks, and things that might might allow you to earn a couple of extra points on your exam. So we'll figure it out once we get there. The best place to go to find those is professormesser.com slash vouchers or use the vouchers link at the top of the Professor Messer website. Let's go back to that question I asked earlier, which was, which of the following would prevent someone from inadvertently viewing sensitive information on a printer output tray? Is it WPA3, duplexing, audit logs, printer sharing, or badging? Let's see how you answered. I've got my buttons here to be able to, <laughs> to, to show all of these. So... The results that we have here show that 70% of you say the answer is badging. And we have 13% that said duplexing, 10% said WPA3, and down to single digits, 5% for printer sharing, and 3% for audit logs. So this is a really good example, by the way, of being able to take the information we, we learned two months ago and by the way, we didn't do very well in October with this question, and you you really came through in December. Uh, either you've been studying very hard or you remember the things we talked about in October. Both of those is very good because 70% is a very, very good number for badging. Uh, this is a real challenge in environments where people are walking up to a printer and then you've got all of these things that have been printed, and sometimes you can find information on top of a printer that has very sensitive details. There's more than one story of people that have walked up to the printer, grabbed their output, and not realized that somebody had printed out all of the salaries for everybody in the company, and you just grabbed it by walking by the printer. Well, how could you prevent that from happening? Well, one of the ways to do that is to have a badge 
and configure the printer to only print when you physically show up to the printer and place your badge to authenticate on the printer itself. This is what's happening here. So they take their access badge, their ID badge, and they click it on the printer. Printer recognizes, oh, that's your badge. Let me look through all of my print jobs. There's your print job. Let me print it out now that you're standing right here. And that way you can be assured if you're the one printing out all of those sensitive documents that you know no one else would be able to get their hands on that because you used your badge to be able to do that. So that is a very good question to use, a very good challenging problem if you're someone who has to maintain security of the output. Uh, I know a lot of us would like to get rid of printers entirely. Probably not going to happen in our lifetime. So we have to make the best of what we have there. You have to know all about these different printer types, how they work, how to configure them, how to troubleshoot them, and how to configure it for badging, that user authentication process. That is the right answer. 71% of you got the answer absolutely right. Well done with the badging question. So now let's change gears just a little bit. As many of you probably know, when you take the A-plus exam, the first handful of questions you get on the exam are not multiple choice questions. This question we just did was a multiple choice question, where you have a question and then multiple answers to be able to choose from. This means that on this particular question, you could have guessed and gotten 20% of it right. Well, CompTIA doesn't want to make it that easy for you. So we would like to have a question that is a little more involved. And these are called performance-based questions. They might be fill in the blank. It could be a, a, a prompt to be able to drag and drop different things. Maybe you have to put things in a particular order. So I have a question for you where I would like you, this one's more of a fill in the blank, which technically you don't get a lot of fill in the blank questions on the exam, but this makes it a little bit harder. So we're going to we're going to struggle through this fill in the blank question which asks very succinctly identify the interfaces. And if you look at your screen I have A B C and D interfaces that are outlined. The A interface if that's difficult to see is the one right here. The B interface just underneath it. The C interface is down here at the bottom as well and the D interface is listed there. Now of course you want to go to the link that's on your screen. Go to professormesser.com slash QA to input what you believe the answer happens to be. Please do not put answers in the chat room. Please don't put any hints in the chat room. We will instead work through all of the A, B, C, and D here to see if you can remember. This is also a good thing to try, by the way. If you're just trying to, to maybe do your own labs, I would recommend going to Google, going to the Google image search, and just search for motherboard interfaces, search for computer interfaces, and you get lots of pictures like this one. And if you can tie back a particular motherboard type to a picture of the interfaces, you can then download that motherboard manual, and they'll show you in the manual what all of those interfaces happen to be. So you can check your, what you're doing inside of Google. It's a very inexpensive way to go through the process of maybe learning more about the inside and outside interfaces and ports on these motherboards all by going to Google Image Search, a very inexpensive way to do it. This particular image and the ones that I show you are coming from a separate service that allows me to use these in this public type of forum. So these, these don't come from Google, but uh, the ones you can find on Google are very, very similar. So this is, this is one you can use to kind of see how well you remember what all of these happen to be. These are, these are some interesting ones. Notice that I didn't choose the easy ones. I didn't choose the USB interfaces too easy. I didn't really choose the, the mini DIN because we don't tend to, to have those. We don't tend to use those very much anymore for keyboard and mouse. This interface is both blue and green. For those of you that have, are familiar with that mini DIN keyboard and mouse connector back in the day, that's an interface that will do either. You know, the older computers had a separate interface for keyboard and a separate interface for a mouse. This one happens to be able to handle both at the same time, which, by the way, I could have used prior to this point when we were, you would always try to work your way behind the computer and plug things in. And very much occasionally it would not go very well because you'd plug the mouse into the keyboard interface and the keyboard interface into the mouse interface and nothing would work. And then you'd have to reverse them. In this case, you can't go wrong. You can plug them, uh, find your keyboard, find your mouse. It plugs into that one interface. Unfortunately, only a single 
mini DIN on this motherboard. So you got to pick one of those. Is you going to plug in a keyboard or are you going to plug in a mouse? Figure out what it happens to be. The reality is you're probably going to use the USB interface. Let's see how you did with this one. Let's identify all four of these interfaces. See if you can remember what you put down for each of these. Let's start with the first one the A interface. If you look at it carefully, you can see that it has kind of an upside down U or maybe an N on the inside of it. And it's not a completely symmetrical interface. There's a little edge that has a corner that is a little bit different than the others. That's because that is a DisplayPort interface. That wouldn't you would plug in a DisplayPort cable that would then connect to a monitor. So if this is a case where you have only DisplayPort available or you would like to use some of the enhanced capabilities that often come from a DisplayPort interface, that's a great place to plug in is that interface on the back of your motherboard. There's also another video interface. That's the option B, which is an HDMI interface. That one may have been a gimme. That one you probably knew about as we were stepping through this. So that is one where uh, those two interfaces, either one or in many cases, both can be used simultaneously to provide video output. So if you have two monitors, you could plug into those two interfaces, and those two monitors would be able to work independently. Or it might be a mirror of both. You have the option, of course, when you're configuring the video output in your operating system. The third one, this third option here, this tiny little interface, maybe one you recognize, although I didn't choose the USB B connections or A connections that are here, uh, there is still USB here. It's a USB-C interface. Now, the type of signal that is running over that interface, we don't know. Is it a video signal like DisplayPort signals? You can run over that. You can run HDMI signals over a USB-C interface, or it could just be USB data. could be a USB signal that we are plugging in. You would have to check the motherboard a manufacturer's documentation to be able to determine what does that USB-C interface support. And that's been one of the biggest challenges with USB-C is just because you see an interface that is physically a USB-C interface, you still don't know what data or signal is on that interface. And it's often good to double check that with the manufacturer's documentation. And the last one, probably one you're familiar with, is the RJ45 Ethernet connection. That's, of course, where you would plug in a wired Ethernet connection. So that would be the best way to make that work. This is, I think, if you're able to work through it, uh, all of these different interfaces can be very different. In fact, we didn't choose a number of them. There were some, looks like, wireless connections on the back. So that's that's one to, to pull from. If you have a separate external antenna you'd like to use, it looks like that's built into this motherboard. Lots of USB uh, A connectors, some that are appear to be lower speed and higher speed all in the same device. And you got some audio output here as well with these TRS connections and even an optical out through this SPDIF type connection. Those particular ones are not on the exam. So we're sort of going off the 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 script just a little bit, but they are good things to know about. And you'll run into them as you work through some of these. Now, are these interfaces uh, ones that are, as we're doing this, is it um, is it particular to the type of, of abbreviations or um, maybe some of the uppercase, lowercase? It doesn't matter to me. As long as you know what that interface is, you could play. You could spell DisplayPort with all lowercase letters as far as I'm concerned. The exam is not going to be that particular. And as I mentioned, the exams don't tend to have fill in the blank. And more likely, you would get a matching question like this one to be able to work through it. That is the ones uh, for our performance-based question of the month. Hopefully, you recognized some of those interfaces. And if you didn't, I would recommend you go out to Google and do a little bit of extra search, not only for interfaces on the back of your computer, you might want to look at interfaces on the inside of a desktop computer. So find some nice motherboard pictures that you can pull from. It would be a great way to be able to do this. Well, I've got too much of me there on the screen. So let's go to the next question that we have in our list. This next question, we're back to a multiple choice based question. And it asks, a company is billed a different amount each month based on data transferred from cloud, a cloud-based application. Which of the following would best describe this billing? Is it rapid elasticity, VDI, 
internal cloud metered or high availability. So we've got a company is billed a different amount each month based on the data transferred from cloud-based applications. Which of the following would best describe this billing? Is it rapid elasticity, VDI, internal cloud, metered, or high availability? If you think you know the answer, go to the link that's on your screen, professormesser.com slash QA, and lock in your answer. Please no answers in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. We'll figure this out as we go along. Yes, it's me trying to figure out all the buttons again. That's why that's why you saw me twice on the same screen. I'm I'm a I'm literally my own picture in a picture. We're we are figuring it out. I am trying to get back into the swing of things. You take a month off and this is what happens. You you don't do that live stream and now you're figuring out all the buttons and everything else and how it works here. It's a little bit little bit of a challenge sometimes to figure out the details. So the question some of you were mentioning on that last one is what if you got some of those answers right and some of those answers wrong? Do you get partial credit? And CompTIA has said in their, their frequently asked questions that's on their website, they answer this and they say, maybe. You might get some points or you might not get points. And we won't tell you if you get points or don't get points. So I, I guess the whole point of that is to say, don't worry so much about how they grade it. Uh, you're never going to figure it out. They're not going to tell you how they grade it. It doesn't help you study better if you know how they grade it. It doesn't help, really help hurt you in your studies if you don't know how they grade it. The, the really best strategy for this is to ignore trying to emulate their grading process and spend your efforts learning everything that's in the exam objectives. Because once you know everything that's in the exam objectives, you're going to pass your exam. It doesn't matter how they grade it. So ultimately, it all comes down to what do you know of the, the topics that are clearly listed in the exam objectives. Stick to that list. You're going to be fine. Don't worry about the grading. It doesn't even matter. Do you lose point for skipping questions? You, they don't take points away from you. But obviously, if you don't answer a question, you don't get points. That's the, At least we know that much when we work through it. Let's see how much you know. Speaking of working through it, on this question that asks, a company is billed a different amount each month based on the data transfer from cloud-based application. And you'll notice not exactly the best grammar here. We're working live here, people. Which of the following would best describe this billing? Is it rapid elasticity, VDI, internal cloud, metered, or high availability? Let's show our results and see what you think the answer is. Wow, 86% of you, a very strong number, say that the answer is metered. We also have single digits. 8% of you said uh, rapid elasticity. 3% said high availability. 2% said internal cloud. 1% said VDI. I think that's a pretty clear, uh, pretty clear vote for a metered service. Metered services are great because if you don't use a lot of the service, you don't have to pay a lot. If you end up using more of that service, your bill goes up a bit as you use it. So this is a great way to do cloud-based billing. This is how I am billed for a lot of the cloud-based services that I use. So if you were to purchase some of my digital products and you download those products, you're actually downloading them from Amazon's cloud because Amazon's cloud is around the world. It's very easy access. It's available 99.99% you know, .99 of the time. That's 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 one of those where you do run into problems sometimes uh, with the cloud-based service. But if I use a little bit, I only get charged a little bit. If I get a lot more that I use, well, then obviously uh, it's, it's one where I have to pay a little bit more. They, these are good problems to have. If you're downloading more, if more people are buying products and more people are downloading them, I'll gladly pay a little bit more for the download access. There are a number of services where it's a flat fee, though. Maybe you pay $20 a month, and it's a flat fee, and it never changes. Well, that's a non-metered service. So there's no additional costs in here. You know exactly what the bill is going to be every month. These generally have a lower number of features or services available to them. They're not quite as flexible as the metered service, but that's not always the case. Sometimes it is. You have to check the terms of the agreement that you've written for that or that you've, you've agreed to for that particular cloud-based service. That would be a good way to do it. So that is the right answer. You are absolutely right. The 87% of you were spot on. You've been working on your cloud, I can tell. That cloud-based service, 
is the great way to do it. So if you are someone who is trying to figure out the cloud, all of these terms that I put as answers are terms from the CompTIA exam objectives. Make sure that you go through all of these and you recognize what those are. So if you're reading through and you think, oh, I don't know what a VDI is, make sure you go back and have a look at those so you know exactly what you might run into. Let's do another question. I've got a multiple choice question waiting for you. This one asks, the monitor on a user's desktop computer has begun flashing on and off randomly throughout the day. Which of the following would be the best next troubleshooting step? Should I replace the HDMI cable, install an updated video driver, upgrade the UEFI BIOS, restore from a known good backup, or clean the fan and airflow screens? This is a, a challenging issue and one you may have run into before. The monitor on a user's desktop computer has begun flashing on and off randomly throughout the day. Which of the following would be the best next troubleshooting step? Would it be replace the HDMI cable, install an updated video driver, upgrade the UEFI BIOS, restore from a known good backup, or clean the fan and airflow screens. If you think you know the answer, go to professormesser.com slash QA right there on your screen and answer the question. Please no answers from a chat room. Please no, no hints in the chat room. We're going to pretend that we are in the exam and we're answering this question right now. We can't Google. We can't ask anything of anyone else. We can't phone a friend. We can't 50-50. That would be nice though, wouldn't it? I would, I would like to be able to do that. So instead, you want to go to that link on your screen, go to professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer. See if you happen to know what it is. There's a lot of things I would do that aren't in this list. Unfortunately, that's not an option you have with, with these exams is you kind of have to follow what they put on the screen. And yes, it's an only a single, the best next troubleshooting step is, of course, where you need to go. So we'll have to figure out what that happens to be. Let's see how you did. You guys locked yours in very quickly. Makes me wonder if you happen to know what this particular answer happens to be. The question again asked, the monitor on a user's desktop computer has begun flashing on and off randomly throughout the day. Which of the following would be the best next troubleshooting step? Is it replace the HDMI cable, install an updated video driver, upgrade the UEFI BIOS, Restore from a known good backup or clean the fans and airflow screens. Let's have a look at what you answered. 66% of you, not quite as strong as the last one, say that it's replaced the HDMI cable. Still a majority, though. We're going we're gonna to stick on that one for the moment and see what, the, what you think the answer might be. Uh, because 26% of you, over a quarter of you, say install an updated video driver is going to fix this particular problem. That may be another one that you could work through. We've got 4% uh, single digits, say clean the fan and airflow screens, and then 1% each for upgrade the BIOS and restore from a known good backup. Well, 66% of you saying if the screen is flashing, replace the cable. Whenever you're dealing with any type of problem that has something to do with a cable or an interface, probably the first thing you should do is check that cable and check that interface. Mostly because, first, of course, it's a physical type of connection, and it's very easy for those physical connections to, to pop out, to, to come loose. Not quite as easy with DisplayPort, uh, but certainly with HDMI, you run into this, and if it's a loose cable, or it could just be a bad cable. You run into those situations, too. Bad cables are very annoying, but it's so easy to check them. You literally can unplug and plug it in in just a second. And it doesn't change anything. It doesn't change the configuration of your system. It doesn't change the drivers in your operating system. It doesn't change the, the state of the OS. You're not rebooting anything. It is simply plugging in and unplugging a cable or removing a cable and replacing it with a new one with exactly the same type of cable. So those are good checks because you're not making a dramatic change. It's so easy and quick to do it makes sense to be able to make that happen. Uh, if the screen is, is going in and out like that, well, that's a problem. You don't, you don't ever want to be in that situation where you're having to deal with screens blanking out and coming back. It's very, almost always going to be something related to the cable. Now, could it be one of those 
other types of things. Could it be the monitor? Absolutely, it could be the monitor. Could it be the settings for the driver? Could it be the driver itself? Yes, it could. But that wasn't the question. The question asked, which of the following would be the best next troubleshooting step? That's what we were looking for. And indeed, you can see that replacing the HDMI cable, 66% of you, really is the easiest, fastest, and it's the solution that changes very little with your system. So that's what I would recommend as well. I think you're spot on the 67% of you by saying replace the HDMI cable. Now, 27% of you said install an updated video driver. Well, why wouldn't we do that? That makes sense. It could be the driver. It might be the driver causing our problem. Let's update the driver. Maybe there's even a new driver we found on the manufacturer's website. We can go out to that website, download the new driver, and install it. Well, that's great, except now you're changing the operating system. You're updating a driver that happens to be there. What if the driver that you're updating actually creates more problems? What if there's a bug in the new driver? So whenever you're making a change like that, you do want to have backups. You want to have a way to go back to the previous driver that you were running. It is a more involved process. You are making a change to the operating system that may be difficult to undo. So this would probably not be the first thing you want to do. What if we could easily simply switch the cable out and, and 60 seconds later see if that's our problem? You know, that's what we would want to be able to do. Now, it could be any other type of cable, of course. You could have some other cable that happens to be there. So it could be a video cable, certainly. But this is one where you want to create or have the least amount of change to a system as you are troubleshooting these types of problems. So I think those of you that answered replace the HDMI cable, you were spot on at 67%. That's also the reason you probably would not want to upgrade the BIOS. That's a pretty dramatic change. You almost never want to upgrade the BIOS as the first thing that you do. That would be something maybe later on. Uh, there are many systems that go their entire lifetime, and they never update the BIOS. That's how unusual and rare it might be to provide a BIOS upgrade. But there are times I ran uh, a system that had a, a hard drive array, and the BIOS on the hard drive controller created situations where occasionally information would be written to the drive in a corrupted form. Don't know if you've ever stored information on a hard drive, but you don't want it stored in a corrupted form. That's a bad idea. But they gave us a BIOS upgrade. We implemented the BIOS upgrade, and all of those problems went away. So there are cases where that might make sense, but probably not the best next thing that you would do. We've also got answers here for restoring from a known good backup. We, we have no evidence at this point that our problem is related to the operating system or any of the programs that are running in that operating system. So probably not quite the time to spend an hour and restore from a known good backup uh, unless you really want uh, the billable hours, I guess. And then lastly, clean the fan and airflow screens. Also not uh, any, there's no evidence here that this has anything to do with heat. It certainly could be a thermal issue. It certainly could be a problem that would create this issue with the video. But we haven't determined that yet based on the question. The question asks what the best next troubleshooting step would be. Why not take 60 seconds, replace the video cable, see if that fixes your problem, and then you're off to the next thing. So important. And, and for those of you in the chat room saying, gosh, you really have to read these questions. Yes, you do. It is the only way to be able to understand what's being asked of you. So yes, you're starting. You're now starting to get it. Like there's there are specifics in these questions. They are constructed a particular way. There are particular words and phrases you should be looking for. Hopefully, you're seeing some of that in the study group today. There's a reason I write them this way. I want to thank Joe in the chat room with the ten dollars super chat. Uh, Shovakri. Sh uh, I, I feel like indeed would be the correct answer uh, there. Thank you for your videos. With these videos, I'll be able to pass my 1101 exam, now working on the 1102. So hopefully we'll see you here on Thursday for your 1102 study group. Hoping to take it in January. That's a pretty good time frame. I think you'll be able to get through it just fine. Congratulations on your 1101. We wish you the best with your 1102. And thank you also for the $10 Super Chat. Also want to thank the 10 Euro Super Chat from Tudor, who did put any Anything in, just the 10, 10 euro super chat. We sure appreciate that. Thank you so much for your support as well. Those super chats, as I mentioned, kind of help keep the lights on. So we appreciate that. Also to Brian, who has $10 super chats, thank you for the support. He says to me, and I thank you for the support right back to you. We sure appreciate those as well. This is one of those where if we're ever in a situation where we're trying to study for these exams, 
read through these questions. They are, they're pretty interesting in the information you would find. But you'll notice already that there is a lot of like details in there. There's a lot of specifics. Like the interfaces that we saw earlier, we really have to know what those interfaces look like. We have to know where they're located in the system. We have to understand about all these security concerns and networking issues and badging on your printers and all of those other pieces. One of the ways that you can do that is by looking through my course notes. I've taken all of the text, all of the important graphics, all of the tables from my study groups, and I have created a set of notes for you that are comprehensive. These notes can provide you with details. This is the PDF version of the notes, the digital edition, as we call it. There's also a physical edition. That was the one I held up here. It's a physical book uh, where we took a bunch of old dead trees and we made a book out of them, pretty colors. Uh, so, And a nice, high-quality, perfect-bound book to be able to have all of the information you need all in one place, either with the physical or the digital. And if you get the physical, I give you this digital version that you see on the screen for free. It comes with it whenever you're working through it. So lots of things that you can find inside of this, these course notes. There's a lot of combos out there. You can get the course notes with practice exams, with downloadable videos, with audio, lots of things to choose from. You can find out more about it by visiting our website at professormesser.com slash 1101 notes. I guess 1101 notes to be completely specific. Is there a way to upgrade from the digital version to the physical? There absolutely is. We'll do it in the right way up. Uh, there is and uh, you just need to send me a note, open a help desk ticket inside of your account, or send me a note from the Contact Us link that's on my website and say, hey, I own this. I would like to get the physical version for the difference in price. And I'll send you a coupon and instructions on exactly how you can do that. So more than happy to do that. It's just a couple of things I have to do on my side to give you that coupon, but it's one that works extremely well. Uh, we we encourage that. If you want a, a physical way to make that happen. That's a, a great way to do it. Let's do some more questions. I've got more here that I'd like to get through. So this next one, as we go through these, this is, this is one that's interesting. A BYOD user has found the option to remove a, to remove, uh, the option to remove the screen lock has been disabled. Which of the following would best explain this configuration? Would it be GPS, cloud backup, MDM, Bluetooth, LTE? A BYOD user has found the option to remove a screen lock has been disabled. So you can't remove the screen lock. You want to, no, let's get rid of the screen lock. Nope, can't do it. Which of the following would best explain this configuration? Is it GPS, cloud backup, MDM, Bluetooth, or LTE? If you think you know the answer, Please don't answer in the chat room. Please no hints in the chat room. You want to go to the link that's on your screen, go to professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer. See if you know this one. In fact, you probably might have this very situation that you need to work through. How, how, how does this work? How does that happen? I thought I would be able to remove the screen lock. No, you cannot. Why? It's my phone, isn't it? Or is it? I don't want to give too much away in this question. So see what you think the option might be that you would use. Choose A, B, C, D, or E by visiting professormesser.com slash QA and lock in that answer. This is, this is one where if you're ever working through the challenges on a system, uh, this is where you really, really run into some interesting troubleshooting issues. So please have a look at those and see what you think. In the meantime, I want to thank Ice Cream Junkie in the chat room with the $10 Super Chat who says, your videos and study sessions have helped me immensely. So glad to hear it. Thank you, Professor Messer. Well, thank you, Ice Cream Junkie, who you clearly stole my name, my YouTube name. I wanted to be Ice Cream Junkie, and you must have got it before me. Because let me tell you, the ice cream part, uh, I am definitely an Ice Cream Junkie. Of all the different desserts, that's the one I would probably choose. We could have a whole hour live stream just talking about Jenny's ice cream, just talking about any ice cream that you happen to see. I'm more than, we should start that. The new ice cream podcast will be next week. Maybe we should do that and work through it. That's, that's my, my contribution to IT is ice cream. I'm not sure that's a contribution at all now that I think about it. Let's see how you did with this question. It asked 
A BYOD user has found the option to remove a screen lock has been disabled. Which of the following would best explain this configuration? Is it GPS, cloud backup, MDM, Bluetooth, or LTE? Let's see how you answered this one if we show the results. 92% of you say the answer is MDM. That's almost 100% if I do the math. That's very close to 100 to be able to do that. 5% said cloud backup, and then 1% said GPS, 1% said Bluetooth, 1% said LTE. So MDM was the thing that people chose. But a lot of people were asking, I don't even know what a BYOD is, much less an MDM. What are you talking about? Where did this come from? I'm not sure what you're talking about. BYOD, of course, means bring your own device. That means that you own the phone. So I've got my phone that I'm going to take to work. And on this phone, I'm going to say, this is the one I'm going to carry around. This is my mobile number. But I want to use my phone to be able to access corporate or organizational resources. Now, there's obviously a challenge there. How do you keep your, your company's information secure while using someone else's phone? Well, the way you do that is through the use of mobile device management or an MDM. This could be hardware, software, sometimes both that can centrally manage all of these devices. So you've got a nice console that comes up. You can see all of the people that are working in your company, usually your, uh, your IMEI or some other identifier that helps this single console find the device. And then you install controls on the phone using that MDM that can enable or disable certain features. So you could allow certain types of data to be stored in a certain area. You can have it so that uh, the camera is disabled, or you can make sure that no one disables the automatic lock that should be on your phone. That way you know if somebody leaves their phone around and somebody else picks it up, they won't immediately have access to corporate data because there will always be a screen lock on that particular phone, and you do that by using an MDM. MDM is a lot of different names if you go out into the industry, but they, they tend to go back to MDM ultimately to be able to find what that particular capability happens to be. So this is also a good way if your company now decides, you know what, we want to have a certain type of lock screen. Instead of using a pin, we want to have it so that you use your face. Or maybe your company might say, mm, a face isn't good enough. We want someone to type in a six-digit code that might include letters and numbers. And you can configure that and set it up through the MDM, the Mobile Device Manager. That's the, that is the answer. 93% of you are spot on with that one and being able to use it. If you're anyone who is working through trying to figure out uh, the challenges with managing mobile devices, they almost always come back to an MDM. And there's a lot of systems now we're starting to see a blending in the industry. This is a little bit off scope, but we're starting to see things blend in the industry where what if you could manage all of your devices from one system, your desktops, your laptops, your mobile devices, and everything? So even the MDM, the, the edges, the, the starting and ending point of an MDM is starting to blur just a little bit because now we have other challenges, other problems we're trying to solve in our environments. MDM, though, is the right answer we were looking for here. Make sure you're familiar with MDM for your exam. Let's do another question, shall we? I think this would be another one you might know. I, this is one that I recently had to deal with. So let's see how well you know this answer. The question asked, during an office move, Ethernet connectors were pulled off the end of a patch cable. Which of the following would be the best way to repair this? Would it be in an inductive probe, a punch down tool, a tone generator, a crimper, or a cable tester. During an office move, Ethernet connectors were pulled off the end of a patch cable. Which of the following would be the best way to repair this? Is it inductive probe, punch down tool, tone generator, crimper, or cable tester? You think you know the answer? We got the link on your screen. Go to professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer. I'll have to see how you do with this one. All of these are real things. All of these are from your CompT exam objectives. All of those are real tools. So you have to pick the right one, though. 
That's your challenge. That's the one we have to figure out. Mm, which one of these tools should I use? What, what would we take advantage of? What would we work through? Uh, and in fact, if you don't, again, if you don't recognize one of those answers, make sure you make a note of that so you can go back and have a look at what that particular tool happens to be when you would use it, what use it might be to you. I have to figure out the details. All of this should be in your toolkit anyway, eventually, to be able to have that there. Let's see if you remember. Now, I'm, I'm in situations where Ethernet connectors get pulled all the time. So we'll have to figure it out and see if you happen to know what it is. We're still having people locking in their answers. I don't want to give anything away, so I'm trying not to talk too much during this. Let's see how you do. Uh, George says there's lots of controversy about fixing a bad cable versus replacing the cable. There's, I don't know of any controversy there. No controversy here. Might be a controversy for you, but there's really no controversy there. Um, there's the, And whatever the answer is, is the answer that, yeah, you, that's the one you would do in every situation. Uh, there is there is certainly no controversy associated with that one. Let's see how you did with this one. The question asked, during an office move, Ethernet connectors were pulled off the end of a patch cable. Happens to me all the time. Which of the following would be the best way to repair this? Would it be inductive probe, punch down tool, tone generator, crimper, or cable tester? 62% of you said crimper is what you would use. 30% of you say it is a punch down tool. So if we had to choose, it's really between those two. And you can see single digits. 3% said cable tester, 3% said tone generator, and then 2% said inductive probe is what you would do. So crimper is what 62% of you chose. Crimper is also what I choose. If you've, if you've got a patch cable and the RJ45 Ethernet connector on the end of the patch cable has been pulled off for some reason, then the best way to replace that is to get a crimper and put the connector back onto it. It just takes a minute or two. Just plug it in, crimp it, you're done. That's it. Now, some people are saying it, if the cable ran through the ceiling then terminated, it would not be cheaper to replace the cable. Should we just replace the whole cable? Probably not. Now, if it's a two-foot cable and you can just pull it out and put in a new cable, perhaps that is a little more uh, effective, maybe a little more cost-effective when working through it. But the question asked, Ethernet connectors were pulled off. How can you repair it? Well, and none of the options were replace the whole cable. So that's, that's how you knew that wouldn't be the right answer. It's a crimper that we would like to use to be able to replace that RJ45 connector on the end. And of course, there are other crimpers that you might find. If you have coax cable, there's a crimper for coax. If you have an RJ45, there's a crimper for RJ45. If you've got an RJ11 connector, maybe you're putting in a phone or a DSL modem, you need an RJ11 crimper. This particular crimper can do either. You'll notice at the end of it are two different connectors. One of those, I believe, can we zoom up a little? What's it say? It says 8P and 6P. So 6 position and 8 position is what that says. The 6 position is an RJ11 connector. The 8 position is an RJ45 connector. And you have to make sure that you, of course, have the right type of connector for the cable that you're using. If you're using Category 5E, you need to use a Category 5E connect connector and a, a crimper that's compatible with that connector type. If you're using Category 6, a little bit different process, but very similar for crimping. If you've got a 6A, Category 6A cable, the process is similar, but a little bit different. You have to make sure you have all the tools to be able to have that here. Now, there are a number of you that said, we'll just use, uh, here's, here's the connectors, by the way. This is a modular connector that has not been punched down. You can notice the copper that's sitting up just a little bit higher than the modular connector. And you can see the tines at the bottom of this, very sharp, that push through the insulation that's on the outside so it can connect to and touch the copper that is on the inside of this. And that's what you want to have. This is once you punch it down, it pushes those copper pieces directly into the cable. You can't even see the tines anymore because they push themselves into the cable that happens to be there. And you've got a really nice, good crimp that you can work through there. That's what you would use to be able to put that connection back on the cable. Now, we did have a number of you, 29%, almost a third of you said, we'll use a punch-down tool. Punch-down tools, of course, are used to connect wires 
into a punch down block. So it might be a 66 block, it might be a, a crone block, it might be one of the other blocks that you have listed in the A-plus exam. But that's one that doesn't have an RJ45 or an Ethernet connector on the end of it. It is simply loose wires, and you're using this punch-down tool to punch individual wires into this block to be able to complete the circuit. That's what you would use. So that is not what you would use, of course. Punch-down tools don't put a new Ethernet connector onto the end of a cable. Only crimpers do that, which is why in this case, crimper would have been the better answer. Punch down tool, not what you would use to put an RJ45 connector on the end of it. Uh, we have 3% of you that said cable tester. Cable testers are great. Once you've put the connector on the cable, you would use the tester to make sure that you didn't switch any of the wires around. You could see how easy it might be as you were putting these wires back in that to, to accidentally put them in the wrong place. So that cable tester can be used for continuity and to be sure that you have them all the way across the cable with the right pinouts. We also have 3% that's a tone generator. This goes hand in hand with the inductive probe, which allows us to find a cable maybe in a big bunch so we can find where those cables might be using the inductive probe and listening for the tones that were added to the cable using the tone generator. If you watch my videos, I actually demonstrate this in the videos where I have a bunch of cables in my hand and we use the tone generator on one end of the cable and the inductive probe to see if we can figure out which one of these cables has the tone generator on the end of it somewhere on the other side of the, of the facility. Uh, great tools to have. If you don't have a tone generator and an inductive probe, I don't know how you find anything in some of these environments. Very, very useful tool to be able to have that. Uh, but in this case, the thing that does allow us to replace an Ethernet connector on the end of a patch cable would indeed be a crimper answer D. If you answered that, the 63% of you got that absolutely right. If you're watching this video for continuing education unit credit, I would like to send you an email that certifies that you were here watching this for an hour. And I can do that if you follow these instructions. You must follow these instructions to qualify for the CEU. You want to visit ProfessorMesser.com. Click at the top or bottom of the website the link for Contact Us. It's really Contact Me. It's going to send me a message. It pops up a, a, a menu, a screen, a form, where you would put in your name, you put in your email address, you would then put in a subject line, and in that subject line, put December 2022 Core 1 study group. That would give me enough information to know what study group we're talking about. And in the body of the message, on a line by itself, I want you to put the super secret code words of the month, Tone Generator. Super secret code words of the month are Tone Generator. That's what you want to put in there. You can, of course, on another line inside of that message, also put any text you would like. I read through all of these. So if there's anything you'd like to send to me, anything you'd like to say, anything you'd like to mention about the study group, that would be a great place to put it. I love getting feedback. I read through every single one of these. I don't necessarily have time to respond back to every single one of these because we get hundreds of these every month. But I do like reading through them, and I do read every single thing that you send to me. Uh, again, top or bottom of the Professor Messer website, click the Contact Us link, put your name, your email address, and the subject line put December 2022 Core 1 Study Group or something like that. And then in the body of the message put on a line by itself, put the super secret code words of the month, Tone Generator. Tone Generator is where you would want to put that in. And then I usually get these back to you in about a week or so. Uh, it takes a little bit of time for me to collect them all and then process them. And there's a, a thing I have to do on my side to go through all of them and make sure they're correct. And then I click a button. There's a lot of things that happen on my side. I know it's a little too much inside baseball, isn't it? But that's uh, the things I have to do on this side to make sure you're putting in the right things. And if you don't follow that process, if you don't follow those steps, mm, you don't get the CEU. So make sure you follow those steps as they are written. I think you'll be just fine. Let's do another question. We got time, right? We can go through this. Let's see how well you know printers. There was somebody that sent me a note earlier that said, can we just do all printer questions on the study group? That would be great. And I thought, well, if I did that, no one would ever come back to another study group. But I wanted to get a printer question in anyway, at least one, so that we can at least get a little bit of printer in there. Uh, this question asks, 
a user has submitted a help desk ticket stating their printer cartridge is clogged. Which of the following printers is in use? Is it 3D, inkjet, thermal, laser, or impact? A user has submitted a help desk ticket stating their printer cartridge is clogged. Which of the following printers is in use? Is it 3D, inkjet, thermal, laser, impact? It's got to be one of those, right? That is that is the five different printer types we need to know for the A-plus exam. So if you know those printer types, you'll do fine. You'll be able to work through it. Printer Printers are a constant problem, aren't they? Printers are the bane of our existence in some case, but I'll, I'll let you in a little bit of secret, a little bit of a thing relating to printers because I used to work with these, the, one of the biggest printers I ever worked with was interestingly one of the very first printers I ever worked with in this industry. It was this enormous chain printer. It's an impact printer, but instead of having uh, these, uh, these, impact printer like you might have with a traditional dot matrix, this impact printer had a chain that spun very, very rapidly, and there would be a hammer that would hit the chain when the right character was going by. I'm not sure who who thought up and engineered this brilliant idea. Uh, it worked extremely well. It was very loud. It had to be put in a, a separate, it, it had a built-in case that went around it because you had to close it up because it was so loud to be able to work through it. I may find an image of that in the after show just so you can see it. It's from, if you search for CDC mainframe printer, you will find this printer. It's it's at least the size of this desk. Uh, you know, all, I can't even reach all the way down this desk, which is so wide. It was It's an enormous printer to be able to work on. Um, and that's that's the one that that I learned printing on. But here's the secret. If you can just learn everything there is to know about how this printer works and the nuances of how you get information from someone's device into a print queue, sent to the print server, and from the print server into the printer, and you become very familiar with that, the problems you have with your, with your printer suddenly go away because you're so familiar with the process. So I, I would recommend that if you're working through printers and you're frustrated, sometimes Instead of disconnecting yourself from the printer, just dive right in. And it's remarkable how well that works. I like people asking if this is live. I'm not sure how we would do it otherwise. We should try that sometime. I'll do a non-live one. We'll see how well that, that turns out. Probably wouldn't turn out very well. This question asks, a user has submitted a help desk ticket stating their printer cartridge is clogged. Which of the following printers is in use? Is it 3D, inkjet, thermal, laser, or impact, what'd you answer? Let's find out. 88% of you say inkjet. Seems like a gimme, doesn't it? We, we got some hard ones we'll, we'll do next. Uh, that is exactly what I would choose as well. That is, that is exactly what I would choose if I was trying to find the right thing, is that particular printer type. See if you're familiar with these printer types as you work through them. There's so many different pieces that you would work through, but the inkjet 88% of you chose that. The reason is that these inkjet printers have these ink cartridges inside of them. And if you've ever had an inkjet printer, you know that they clog all the time. The, the way that the printer ink is manufactured, the engineering behind it, uh, makes it very uh, colorful. It's able to come out of this cartridge in tiny little dots and provide very, very fine and detailed output. But boy, it just constantly clogs. Many inkjet printers will even have a, a process it runs through every day. You're not printing the printer and suddenly you hear the printer doing something. It tries to move the printhead back and forth and some other techniques to be able to prevent this from clogging. This is a clogged inkjet. Just a mess. That's, that's all printer ink that is clogged up on that. And once you clean it or you replace it with a new cartridge... It looks like that. That's what you want is that cartridge view right there. So obviously being clogged, let's go back to the previous. That's not what we want. That's awful. That's what we were shooting for. That's that's the piece. But cartridges, clogging, ink, all of these things together, that equals an inkjet printer. Uh, other printers do not use cartridges that clog ink. 
So, uh, for example, a 3D printer doesn't have a cartridge. Uh, it's simply heating up. All uh, There's a lot of different techniques for 3D, but none of the techniques that we commonly use for 3D printers would have a cartridge, and it wouldn't clog based on that. Uh, thermal printers don't have ink cartridges. Laser printers don't have ink cartridges and don't clog that way. And then impact printers don't have ink cartridges, and they don't clog either. So those are the different choices. Obviously, given those limitations, the only thing that makes any sense is indeed answer B, the inkjet printer. 88% of you got that one absolutely correct. Now, I know that we are at the top of the hour, but let's do one more, shall we? Let's step through uh, what that happens to be. Um, if we have a look, uh, let's do this. Um, Let's do another question. I've got one more in here that we could work through kind of over time for the question. And the question asks, a developer is using a cloud-based service to build a custom application based on predefined modules. Which of the following would best describe this cloud model? Would it be SAAS, DAAS, IAAS, hybrid, or PAAS. It's got to be one of those. Now, I'm obviously not saying it exactly right as we step through this. That's on purpose. The question again asked, a developer is using a cloud-based service to build a custom application based on predefined modules. Which of the following would best describe this cloud model? Is it SAAS, DAAS, IAAS, hybrid, or PAAS? If you think you know the answer, there's your link, professormesser.com slash QA. Lock in that answer, and we'll be able to get the right answer to you. See if you know. Anything cloud-based. I also get people to say, let's do more cloud-based questions. Again, I don't know if cloud-based is where I really want to go with a, an entire study group of, of cloud and printing. <laughs> None of you would come back. Uh, we have to do something else other than those two. Um, but they are challenging questions, I think because you don't really have – uh, any of these technologies, you don't generally have cloud-based services you run at home. That's why. Uh, once you get into using cloud-based services, you start working with cloud-based services. Uh, that was That's one where this just becomes second nature. But unless you have at your house a 3D printer, a laser printer, an inkjet printer, a thermal printer, you sort of don't understand the nuances except what you read and what you can see in a video. And that's that sometimes you need that extra step. You need something you can touch, something you can work with that can really solidify those thoughts, those ideas into your noggin, into your brain so that we can work through those. That's what I would also recommend is get as much hands-on and as much work with any of these technologies, especially if you're someone who is working through trying to kind of understand the technology. If you're, there's a particular technology you're really struggling with, a lab can often be the thing that you need. That could be the answer uh, and working through those. And you guys answered this one not quite as fast as the others. So let's see how you did with this one. The question asked, a developer is using a cloud-based service to build a custom application based on predefined modules. It's a very specific question. Which of the following would best describe this cloud model? Is it SAAS, DAAS, IAAS, hybrid, or PAAS? What did you answer? I have to know. Let's find out. So we step through this. 41% well, of you say that the answer is SAAS or software as a service. You can see 37%, I would say it's almost a tie for first place, is PAAS or platform as a service. 12% of you, which was our last double digit, says infrastructure as a service. And then we have 5% said desktop as a service and 6% said hybrid. So the answer, or at least the not the majority of you, but the plurality of you said 41%, uh, it would be software as a service. I think when we are going through a lot of cloud-based questions, a lot of us are familiar with software as a service, and we tend to lean towards that 
particular answer. It's what I, what I found over the years anyway, is we tend to lean into software as a service because that's what we're most familiar with. But this question really asks for something very specific. First, it was an application developer. They're using the cloud, and they're building an application, not only building the app, but they're using predefined modules to build the app. And that really fits perfectly into something that is a platform as a service, or PAAS. This is, this is rapidly, if you look at the industry, this is rapidly moving into that area of no code, where let's do as little coding as possible and more using of individual modules or, or Legos to be able to just take a Lego that's already built and plug it into our application which makes it much easier to do application development because you don't have to write everything from scratch. You can simply uh, grab a module. Maybe they have a login page. We'll take the login page Lego and put it as the first Lego in our app. And then they have an inventory Lego. Well, we're building an inventory app. We'll take the inventory module and put it next in our app. And in fact, many of these allow you to just draw lines between them to create the flow for the application. So I think that that is where we want to go with this is to kind of understand the nuances behind all of these and working through what we would what we would use to kind of build these. So if you're using uh, Salesforce.com, for example, especially the Salesforce.com that is not the software as a service, but you're building applications on the Salesforce platform, that is platform as a service. I have a lot of other content on cloud-based services that might help you. But that one fits perfectly with someone who is building an app and using predefined modules. You can think a uh, platform as a service. Just remember Legos. The Legos are, are kind of the best way to step through what all of these might be. And that's, that kind of fits nicely with how platform as a service would work. So it's not software as a service. It's not the 40%. Indeed, it's the 38% of you that said platform as a service. That one is the right answer. That's the one we would use. That's the one that is the important answer and the one we need to remember if we're ever building an application on a cloud-based service using a set of predefined modules. It really can't be anything but platform as a service. That is what we would choose. Now, as, as we went through these today, one of the things you noticed is that there were a lot of different topics we covered. They were covered in, uh, we talked about this earlier with one of the very first questions is, there's a set of cadences, a style, a tone, if you will, that CompTIA tends to use for their questions. It's not a difficult style. It's not an unusual tone. These are very straightforward questions. If you know the answer, if you know your content, the answers are very clear when you go through these. But it's helpful if you can get a feel for what that style happens to be. And one of the problems I found on the internet is there are not a lot of places you can go to get very good practice exam questions. There are just not a lot out there. Uh, you've got a lot of people that have a lot of questions they can provide, but the questions have no recogni recognition or are not similar at all to the exam questions. I'm still running into brand new practice exams that I'm seeing from other places that have questions from previous versions of the exam that are no longer even covered, which don't help you either. That's really frustrating if you ever get into that. And that's why I created these practice exams. I wrote my own book of practice exams, three separate practice exams, put them into this PDF format that can be printed out as a book. You can use them online. It is a great way to learn more about what's on the exam. Let's do one. You know, a lot of folks want to do another question. So let's go to my practice exams book. This is a practice exam number A9. Uh, this practice exams book, uh, obviously, each exam, there's three exams in here, 90 questions each. There are both multiple choice and performance-based questions in here. But let's do number nine. It says, should I do this one? Because uh, this one is a gimme because we talked about this. Let's see how well you were listening. This question asked, a network connection in a conference room was installed years ago, and there's no documentation for the cable run. Connecting a device to the cable results in a successful Ethernet connection. So the other end of the cable should terminate somewhere in the wiring closet. Which of these tools would be the best choice to find the other end of the network connection? Is it cable tester, tone generator, multimeter, or crimper? Now, as we go through this, 
Obviously, we don't want to answer in the chat room. We want to instead uh, keep any answers to ourselves at the moment as we step through these. But one of the things you'll find in this book is it's not just a PDF. One of the things you'll find is that the questions and the answers that you get, you can click on. You can do things with. Um, this is the one that we will work through. And so you can, of course, mark a question if you think you know the answer. You can mark it because it's a PDF. I can use annotation to be able to use this and work through it. Uh, but whenever we start going through these questions, um, another thing I like to do, especially in my book, because it's digital, is I built in some extra things. You could go to page 31 and go to that question, go to that answer, and certainly go through the, the pieces of it. Or you can actually click where it says the details. Notice that your mouse turns into the little hand there. And if you click that, it goes to the answer page. It just jumps all the way over to that page. So you don't have to constantly scroll through a book and scroll back to the other thing. It just takes you to the answer page. And it tells you that the answer is indeed B, tone generator, is what you would use for this. That is what the answer happens to be. And in fact, one of the things you'll notice in this book is every time there's an answer, I give you an explanation on why that is the right answer. Now, my problem is that I always get answers wrong, but a lot of the tools that I've used in the past never told me why the answer was wrong. So every single question in my practice exams book has a list of all of the incorrect answers, and I give you an explanation as to why that answer was not the correct one. And all of these deal with questions and answers that come from the exam objectives. And that's why I even tell people, if you get the question right, take a moment, read through the incorrect answers so you have some context as to why those were there. Because on your actual exam, you might get a question where the answer is multimeter or crimper or cable tester. You never know what it might be when you get to that point. I also put into this, at the very bottom of every answer page, a QR code and a link that will take you to the actual video where the question originated. So if you're reading this and you're thinking, I don't know what a cable tester is. I don't know what a crimper is. I don't know what any of these things are. Let me go watch the video first so I can learn more about it. And since I'm in a PDF reader, I can use the back button. We can go to the original question, and then I can go to the next question in my list and simply repeat the process. That is my practice exams book. You can get this on my website, professormesser.com slash core1pe, or just follow the links on the menus at the top of the website. Um, we spend a lot of time making sure these books are not only accurate with the tone and style of the exam, but they are accurate with the content of the exam, which for some reason is for, for whatever reason, it's the hardest part for other people to be able to do. Find out more about that, professormaster.com slash core1pe. And there's some benefits if you buy it with the course notes. There's also a discount included. So as you add on more, uh, more study materials, you get a little bit of a discount as we go through this. Something you find on the website. Speaking of the objectives, uh, these are free. You should download these before you do any studies. This also makes a very good list that you could use before you go into the exam. There's a link to the objectives on my site from professormesser.com slash objectives. But there's also an easy way to find it. Just go to your favorite search engine. Go to CompTIA exam objectives. It will take you right to the page where you can download those. If you know everything in this document, you're ready to take the exam. And if you know everything in this document, you're going to pass your exam. It would be very, very difficult to, to be able to do all of this and somehow not be able to pass your exam because everything is in there. It tells you everything you need to know. So absolutely where you should go. Uh, Bia says, do you sell this book in Europe? I, I ship books everywhere. So if you want the physical book, I'll ship it anywhere in the world that, that ships, that allows you to receive mail. Not all countries are receiving mail right now. So uh, if you're in a country that receives mail, I'll be glad to send that to you, which is pretty much anybody, certainly in Europe. Uh, you can get those. As I mentioned, I do one of these study groups every month for each of the courses on my site. So we do 2A+, plus, we do a Network+, plus, and a Security+. Plus. The next study group for A+, plus will be December 8th. But we've also got A+, plus study groups coming on January the 3rd and January the 5th. January of 2023. What happened there? Like, boom. Suddenly, it's a new year. So that that does happen from time to time. So, of course... I would, I would recommend you go 
down that route. Make sure you make a note of these. Of course, you'll always find the next event on our calendar. Go to professormesser.com slash calendar. It's also in our link on Discord. But we're not done. Even though I'm done asking you questions in this first hour, I want to take questions from you in the second hour. So get ready for our after show where I'll be able to answer questions that you put into the chat. Don't forget about the vouchers and the free exam hacks ebook at professormesser.com slash vouchers. My practice exams are available on my website along with my course notes. And of course, you can always follow us when we're not here live at professormesser.com slash Twitter slash YouTube slash Instagram slash Discord. Just type in something and see if I'm there. That's one of the easiest ways to do it. Certainly the process to go through. Hopefully that gives you an idea of things you can do coming up. we got a lot more. Stick around for the after show. Thank you for being here for this first hour. We'll see you next time on the Network Plus, or excuse me, the A Plus study group. See, I didn't even know what study group I was working on. I thought it was the I thought it was the Network Plus study group for a moment there. You can tell I've been writing content for Network Plus already because it's in my it's in my brain. That's what I've been thinking about as we go through it. It's time for the after show, everybody. It's time for uh, the point where I stop asking questions of you and you can start asking questions of me. So it's a little bit different in how we swap all of these things out. Uh, the way you would do that is go to your chat that you have here. If you're on my website at professormesser.com slash live, uh, you can certainly see there's a chat embedded on the page. That's the one I'm looking at. This is the YouTube chat. So if you're on YouTube watching this live, the YouTube chat is right in front of you. You can use that one. And we can, of course, go back and forth as to the questions that are there. Uh, the code word of the month was given earlier. If you don't know what it is, you'll need to go back and figure out those pieces. Uh, that's one where you have to watch the video to be able to do that and to be able to work through it. Uh, so we will, of course, step through all of these and figure out the details. Uh, question, the questions that come in can be IT-related questions. They might not be IT-related questions like this one from Dennis who says, Professor, are you a Dolphins fan? Well, we are in Florida, so I guess there is some type of connection there we have to do with the Dolphins. Uh, I don't live in South Florida. I used to live in South Florida for about 10 years. I no longer do that. I did have some family members that worked for the Dolphins organization, and my uh, brush with greatness was going to their Christmas party one year, which was ridiculous. Uh, like Santa Claus came to the party. I don't mean the son, like Santa's helper. Like Santa Claus was there at the Dolphins Christmas party. It was amazing. That was back, though, during the – that was sort of the Dan Marino days. That that goes back a ways because I'm old. Uh, and that, that was one where it was great, though. Uh, we all, really didn't get a lot of great tickets to uh, the games – because if you worked for the Dolphins, you didn't get great tickets, ironically. Uh, unless, of course, you were on the field. That was different. Uh, but if you worked in their uh, back office, uh, we did get some great tickets where we sat in, the, um, in the, the upper levels where there would be uh, usually press. And so some of those seats were actually quite good uh, to be able to work through them. A uh, question from uh, D. Ben says, how long are the vouchers valid for after you purchase them and do they expire? All vouchers do expire. The ones on my site are good for about a year, minus a day or two, depending on when, you know, I buy the inventory and get it back to you. So uh, about a year, which is a lot of time. I highly recommend that if you are going to be buying your vouchers, make sure you purchase them uh, before, just before you're ready to take the exam. There are a few people that will purchase a voucher at the beginning of their studies and then life happens and things occur and then suddenly they realize, oh no, this expires in a week and then you're left with a voucher that, that is no good because that, that doesn't work so well when you work through those. That, that's a challenge. So I would not recommend buying your voucher until you're just about ready to take the exam and that's the way you should do it. Some people buy their voucher and schedule their exam as a motivational tool, which is kind of a neat way to do it because when you know there's a date that you have to take that exam, you might work a little harder. If that's the way you motivate yourself, then maybe you buy the voucher a little bit early. Uh, but I would recommend waiting if you go through that process uh, and not having to worry so much about when that might happen. Uh, there are a lot of acronyms on the exam. So some of you are working through acronyms and having to deal 
with all of that. So that is that is a real challenge. Uh, ac in this industry, we just do a lot of acronyms. Um, it's sort of how how this works. Wait till you get to Network Plus. That's when you're going to see a lot of acronyms. So another good way to do it. Um, uh, Sniddles asks, uh, after you've passed the A+, plus, the Network Plus, and the Security Plus exams, what's the best way to keep these topics fresh? Along with study materials I provide, I uh, love the work you do as well. Thank you. Love you too. Uh, the, the thing that I find helps me is to keep going. So whether that's to move into Microsoft, do some Linux certifications, get more networking knowledge, understand more security knowledge, you never stop learning in IT. It's not like you get your A plus network plus and security plus. Okay, I'm done. We're finished now. I can be an IT professional. It does not work that way. Uh, throughout IT, first, you're never going to learn everything you need to know. You, there will always be questions you don't know the answer to. As frustrating as that is, that, that is the reality that we, we work through. And so I always tell people you just keep going and you keep learning and you keep adding to the things you know. And in fact, that is the real important thing about IT is if you keep doing that, your specific knowledge grows, you become more knowledgeable, especially in, in niches that you may find, and it tends to provide you with more value. People will pay you more the more you know. So I always tell people, keep going. Don't stop. Just keep going, 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 going. Um, and that would be the best way to do it. I mentioned earlier, the uh, the exam objectives are so valuable. And this question uh, really, really points out why from Gregory. He says, what would, your what would be your advice for someone who's just starting to learn this material? Not sure your progress. What should they do to measure their progress? I say go to the exam objectives. The exam objectives are written out in just an enormous set of bullets of things you need to know. It's well organized. So grab the top section. Maybe it's, maybe it's four bullets. Maybe it's seven bullets. Learn everything you need to know about those seven bullets. Lock it down and then go the next set of bullets. And so you can take this a little bit at a time. You just take little bites. You don't have to learn everything all at once. Just take a little bite at a time and go forward a little bit, a little bit, a little bit as you go. Just so you can really understand this. Uh, the shotgun approach does not work very well for CompTIA. You can't just learn everything and then go take the exam in a week and you're done. Doesn't work quite that way. So I would say take them a little bit at a time and you'll notice that you can tell after a little bit of time, oh, this is going to take me a month. Maybe it'll take me two months. Maybe it'll take me three months, but I'll be able to get through all of these things. That's how I recommend because it's a lot. It's a lot of material uh, that is very broad, uh, but not very deep. So that's the good part is that you're able to kind of collect all of this information without having to go incredibly deep into the details, but you still have to know all of those different technologies. And I think the objectives are the best way to do that. Um, other questions that have come in, I had one that come in. Let me flip back up here and have a look. Um, what's the deal with the labs offered on your site for A+. Plus? And any advice on how to set up labs access equipment to get hands-on for those not working in IT? Uh, on my site, uh, the deal, uh, and I'm, perhaps I'll show this to you uh, if I go to my own website. Uh, underneath my website connection, uh, let's bring this up with me in it. There we go. Uh, on my site, if I go to maybe study recommendations, oh, thank you, Google, for the ad right there in the middle of the screen. Uh, and if we look at our study resources for A plus, Network plus, and Security plus, I have the CompTIA labs that are here. Uh, these are labs from CompTIA. These are the CERT master labs that they offer, um, and they're so good. Uh, especially this latest round of the A plus, Network plus, and Security plus, they've done an amazing job with creating some labs that are very accurate towards the exam objectives, and they have some interesting labs to go through. Uh, some of it's even in 3D. It's kind of hard to see from here, but I've got a demonstration of this in one that I did before. But those are the CertMaster Labs, and they are exceptional. Uh, I like them a lot, or else I wouldn't have put them on my site to be able to do that. Um, the other part of your question asked about being able to get hands-on for uh, people, being able to do this. The labs are very good at doing that. Um, but if you have the opportunity to get hands-on for uh, let's take a, a wireless router, for example. 
Uh, Hands-on for a wireless router. I think I can probably find one of these real quick. I don't. I want to do this Google first before I do it. But I want to search for a wireless router emulator. I think that's probably pretty good. And if you Google that, there are a number of sites like TP-Link emulators, routeremulator.com, uh, and other emulators there. I don't know that I've used any of these offhand. So let's click on routeremulator.com. Uh, which is just an awful, ugly site. Probably not the best choice to choose. Let's choose the first one, which is the TP-Link emulators. That's a little bit nicer. You've got a bunch of emulators to choose from. Find one that's like the one at your house, and you can connect to it, and it gives you a similar front end and a similar screen to the actual router or switch or emulator or the, the device that you're using. So it's a very easy way to get some hands-on without necessarily going through the process of setting up a physical device, which sometimes is a challenge. Um, so some of these things might help you too, plus they're free uh, to be able to work through those. So absolutely. Uh, and, and being able to work through all of the different pieces of that. Uh, other questions, let's flip through some more of these. Um, this is a very common question, which asks, how fast do you need to pass the second part of the A-plus once you pass the first one? Obviously, there's two exams you have to pass. You have to pass the core one and the core two, which at this point are the 220-1101 and the 220-1102. So let, you can take these in either order. So you could take the core one first or you could take the core two first. But that leaves another one that you have to take before you're A-plus certified. You have to pass both of them to be A-plus certified. So the the challenge that you have is timing. Um, fortunately, there's no specific time frame that you have to worry about. You simply have to pass both of those exams before the entire series is retired. So if you take the 1101 and pass it today, you have until October of 2025 or so to take the second one and pass it to be A-plus certified. So you really could wait like three and a half years between these as long as you take both of the exams, pass both of the exams from the same series. So there is no time frame. There's no limitation. There's, no, there's nothing you have to hurry up and do. You just have to pass both of them before the entire exam series is retired. Hopefully that gives you some perspective. Other questions. Um, Let's see other ones that happen to be here. Um, once you get these certificates, what's the best entry-level job if you want to get into cybersecurity or game programming? Well, unfortunately, cybersecurity and game programming, neither one of those are entry-level jobs. They're not. Um, I often tell people, and I get the cybersecurity question quite a bit, is how do I get into cybersecurity? How can I jump right in, right out of college, into cybersecurity? And I, the answer is that's not easy to do at all. There are not a lot of jobs out there that are entry-level jobs in security. Probably the best entry-level job in security that I can recommend, if you look around for them and you happen to be in a geography that has these, is with a SOC, a Security Operations Center, an SOC. That's your secret term to, to use for this for searching, is the SOC or Security Operations Center. Uh, and usually what you're effectively in is a help desk position at a SOC. But at least that's a little bit of security that you're getting from this. But to get a very good job in IT security, you need a very good foundation in operating systems and a very good foundation in networking. That's not something you sort of stumble into. That's years of experience that you can then apply towards a job in IT security. That's sort of the path that most people will take. As far as game programming, that's on the computer science side. We don't do programming here. IT is not programming. Programming is not IT. As badly as companies would like to push those together a little bit closer, it doesn't work that way. Physics is somehow involved. Uh, we can't push those things away. So uh, game programming, you probably don't want to take A+, plus, Network+, plus, or Security+. Plus. Those are not programming skills. They're not programming certifications. Uh, that's a completely different world in the computer science side and not one that I tend to worry too much about and work through. Um, other things that have here. Um, so this one, I'm an audio engineer that did mixing, local audio networks through Dante and streaming question. Where would I fit in after I got Security Plus and Network Plus? I think the Network Plus is probably, if you're into the world of 
audio engineering, everything is networked these days. Everything is connected together with network connections. Um, even the, the ones that I have in the studio, I've got a mixer here that connects. It, it's effectively a, a Linux on the inside, and it connects to everything using Ethernet. It just packetizes everything into an Ethernet packet and puts it in there. So this has IP address. It's got uh, NTP that it runs to make sure the clock is right. It's a computer. It just looks like a mixer and acts like a mixer. Um, so I think networking is probably the one that gives you the best chance at making that work. Uh, I want to thank, uh, I've had a couple things pop up with this. I do want to thank um, uh, C. Gomez Jr. 81 for the $20 super chat. Thank you so much for the super chat and for supporting what we do here. There's no message there for me to look through, but we appreciate your support. And thank you so much for the super chat um, and what we do with it. it. It helps keep the lights on, helps us keep doing these live streams. So we should appreciate that as well. Um, so let's do some more questions uh, that have come through the chat. How are we doing on time? We're doing very good on time. Um, so let's see if I've got another question that came in. Um, so this this is a pretty good one. Um, and this isn't uh, someone who's providing an answer to someone else, but I think it fits into what we were talking about here. My experience doing the core one last week showed me the questions are very tailored and reading the wording of the question matters a lot. And that's absolutely true. Hopefully you were able to get a feel for that during the questions that we did in the first hour. But this is a very good example for someone who's taken the exam and says, yes, reading the questions is an important part of the exam. They cram a lot of information into a very small space. They're not incredibly involved questions, but the two or three sentences that you get will be very specific and very pointed, very detailed towards the things that you need to do. So absolutely, I, I second this opinion. It's a great one uh, if you're working on your exam. Uh, Rydell, thank you, uh, who says, I just ordered your A-plus book, Pass Security Plus, and also a $3 Super Chat. So thank you so much for, of course, all three of those things. Uh, thanks for ordering the book. Congratulations on your Security Plus, and thank you for your support with the Super Chat as well. And we wish you the best with your A-plus studies. Uh, we're always in Discord. Let us know if you have any questions as you go through all of these. Um, another question that came up, this is more about kind of studying. Uh, this is a question from David that says, what's the best method of studying uh, for a first timer who knows nothing about information technology? Um, it, it could be argued there are some people in the industry that don't know very, a lot about information technology. You're, so you're pretty much on the same working level right there. Um, I think the best method of studying this content is to first get a lot of different kinds of study materials. Get a book, watch a video series, get some hands-on, and get some practice exams. Those are my four things that I always recommend to folks. I think a book provides you with detail that you simply can't get from a video because they're different types of media. You 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 acquire that information, you you learn that information in different ways. And in, because of that, they kind of work hand in hand with videos. A book and a video, that's a good one-two punch. If you can only get two things to study from, those are the two things I would recommend. Then if you can get a lab, so some hands-on, working with some of these tools, working through Windows, working with some Linux, those are great tools to work with as well. And lastly, the Q&A, I think, is important to give yourself some information about how well have you remembered all of this content. So how all four of those things, I think, are good investments. They're going to give you a way to learn in very different ways between all of them. And ultimately, going through the exam objectives will give you the feedback you need to understand if you've really learned it or not. So everything that I mentioned all circles back to those exam objectives. That's what I would recommend for your first-time studies, even if you have known nothing about information technology. Um, should be pretty good. Do you have to pay for both the 1101 and 1102 vouchers? Generally speaking, unless otherwise posted on other sites that I've seen, uh, one voucher is good for one exam sitting. So if you buy one voucher, you can either take your 1101 or your 1102. But once you take that exam and you need to take the other exam, 
you're going to need to purchase another voucher. So for the A+, plus, you have to purchase at least two vouchers. For the Network Plus, you only need one voucher because it's only one exam. For the Security Plus, you only need one voucher because it's only one exam. But for A+, plus, it's two exams. You have to have two vouchers. So, uh, and again, buy them as you need them. You don't need to buy both at the same time unless you're really planning to take them both uh, back and forth uh, between each other in a, or kind of a, at least within the next year. I know, realize sometimes that's difficult to schedule, sometimes to know that and work through it. Uh, let's see some other questions that have come in. I'm going to keep scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Um, this is this is one I'm I'm right here with you, ice cream junkie. Are we the same person? When I participate in class, do practice questions, and in study sessions like this one, I do well. But when I take the time practice exams, I do poorly. Solidarity. That's me too. Any advice on how to do better in exam environments? There's the stress of taking a timed exam, the anxiety associated with a timed exam. Uh, for me and for others, is uh, palpable. It's noticeable. It's it it affects your ability to take these exams. I'm right there with you. Um, this is sort of a problem when I go to take these exams. I will go into an exam like the CompT exam. I'll go into an exam center. That's again, I still recommend going to an exam center and taking this rather than taking it at home. And we can talk more about that if you'd like. Uh, but I like sitting in the exam center. And if I jump through, the first thing you have to do when you sit down in the exam center is they give you this long document called the candidate agreement, which specifies how you should be able to take this exam and what you're able to do with the information that you see on the exam. It's effectively a non-disclosure agreement where you're saying you're not going to tell other people with what you see in here, and you're going to be fair um, and not cheat when you take the exam. And you agree to that, you sign it, but they give you about 10 to 15 minutes 20 minutes to read through this document and digitally sign it at the bottom. Well, in the past, I simply, I've already read it so many times. I scroll to the bottom, click, okay, let's start this exam. Let's get going. But because the adrenaline is going and I'm nervous and there's anxiety, I get my first question and I read through the question, which says a, a, a technician is trying to solve a problem with this printer and something happened and this other thing. And I read through it. And I, once I finished reading the question, I realized I didn't understand any of the words that I was reading there. Is it a different language? Why did I not? I don't understand. Let me read it again. And I try to read it again. I got a couple more words that time. But because the anxiety is there for a lot of us, it's very difficult. You got to settle down. And about 10 minutes into the exam, okay, I'm finally in here. I can finally read the questions. I can interpret them. I can understand them. I understand English again, and I can take the exam. So what I recommend doing for those environments, if that's you, if that's a situation you run into, don't rush through the candidate agreement. Read it. You got 15 minutes to sit there and read through the candidate agreement. And you can read through all of it. Take your time. <sighs> Breathe in, kind of deep breathing. Deep breathing is always good for anxiety. Do your, do your normal anti-anxiety exercises of deep breathing in through the nose, out through the mouth. Let me read through the Canada degree. 15 minutes goes by, and you're in a better place. Okay, I agree to the candidate agreement, and now let's start the 90-minute counter on the exam. And I think that'll give you a couple extra points. I think that'll make the experience go much better for you. That's what I would recommend. Um, it's one of those things you kind of have to work through. Everybody's a little bit different with their anxieties. Everybody's a little bit different with their exam situations. But find the exam situation that works best for you, and I think that might help you. Maybe that, that's a couple of tips I have based on me suffering through trying to take an industry exam. Uh, it's one of those things you just always have to do. Um, other questions that have come up. So since I brought it up, is on-site testing better then at home testing, how so? Um, there are advantages and disadvantages to taking an exam at a testing center. There are also advantages and disadvantages to taking an exam at home. And for me, the advantages for taking the exam at a testing center far outweigh the, the advantages I get from taking it at home in my particular example. Uh, there are other examples 
where taking it at home is a much better idea. So let's step through both of these. I think the biggest problem we have found with taking an exam at home is that there is great, there seems to be inconsistency with how the exams are proctored. The, there's someone, when you're taking the exam at home, you have a camera, someone's watching you. They are recording the entire exam session. They're also listening to you through the microphone. They are hearing what's going on around you. And they tend to be very strict on you not saying anything. Some people like to talk in their exam, which to be fair is not allowed at a testing center. But when you're the only one in the testing center, you can kind of get away with it. But if you are at home, they will tell you, they'll send you a chat on the screen saying, stop talking. Because you're sitting there and going, a technician finds it's working through a printer and there's a, they'll say, stop, stop chatting, stop talking. You can't talk when you're in the exam because they, if there's a record, something recording around, you're recording the questions from the exam. That's why. And as I mentioned, you can't talk in a testing center either, although some people do. I think there's a little more leeway in a testing center. If you go off camera, if you're taking your exam at home and you're suddenly trying to find a question, you're looking at the screen, you're thinking, I can't see. That's very tiny. You'll get a message on the screen saying, hey, you can't, you can't be off the screen. You can't be off the camera. You're over here trying to read the screen, and suddenly they will say, well, that your exam's over. You were cheating. Click. You just lost all the money you spent on the voucher. You do not get a retake. That never happens. Well, I won't say never happens. Sometimes it has happened if you complain loudly enough. Um, but that's another example of how they'll say, nope, your exam's over. That's it. But if you're at a testing center, you can lean up on the screen. Nobody's watching you through a camera. They might be watching you through a camera up here, but they can see that you're trying to lean into the screen to see what's on the screen. So that's why I often say if you can, if there is a testing center near you, it's a testing center that is comfortable, the equipment is good, and it's an environment that works very well for your studies, go to a testing center. It is so much less worrisome. And if you're like me, I've already told you, I hate taking exams, all the anxiety, that takes a whole bunch of anxiety away when you go into a predefined testing center that's always the same every time. At home, there's a lot of rules and regulations, and sometimes you can fail the exam just because you look down for a moment because something fell off your desk or you went outside the screen and uh, they'll just say you failed and that's it. So that's why I tell people I am going to go to the testing center. Now, if you are someone who lives an hour from a testing center, well, then take, taking it home is perfect. You save so much time, so much effort, um, and you can take it right there. But you just have to be prepared for all of those nuances. I often tell people, go out to the CompTIA subreddit, read through the testing experiences that other people have had, and you will be better prepared if you take your exam at home. I think that's always a good idea. Uh, and that's my opinion. Uh, your environment may be a little bit different. You may be working through different kinds of problems. So I, of course, take the advantages and disadvantages and, and go the one that makes sense for you. It's it's a it's a little bit different in both scenarios. Um, uh, here's a good question. Hey, we didn't have any study groups in November. Why not? Well, because I didn't record any, because we didn't have any. I wasn't able. My schedule was such in November. I just was not able to fit one in, so we didn't have any in November. That doesn't happen very often. In fact, that's the first time in like five years that that happens. Um, but we we tend to do one every month. So I do plan on. We're doing some in January. We'll do some in February. We're keep it going. Uh, November is just a weird, a weird time. So that's that's why. Uh, wasn't you? It's me. How many times have we heard that? Uh, hey, what about certified ethical hacker jobs? I I greatly dislike this certification. I greatly dislike the company that supports the certified ethical hacker certification. I'm not real pleased with the things they've done in the past. I'm not real pleased with their internal operations. Uh, and that's why I've never created any certified ethical hacker content. And I personally don't recommend taking the certified ethical hacker certification only because of the information they want from you, your personal details. They have traditionally not done very well at protecting your personal information. And so I'm not going to take, I'm not going to recommend to you to take an exam that I personally would never take. And, and that's my opinion. Now, 
The other side of this is there are some employers that want you to have a certified ethical hacker certification. And there may be jobs. And if you look at the content on the certified ethical hacker exam, the content's pretty good. So it's not an awful certification. I just don't like the process behind the scenes. I don't like the back office part of it. The, exam, the certification itself is OK, but I'm never going to take it. And I wouldn't recommend anybody, anybody else to take it because I won't. Um, that's the only reason. So really just a personal thing. Ultimately, they've just been hacked so many times, and your personal content has been given out so much from this company that I just can't recommend you give them anything of privacy because it'll just get out to the Internet, um, it seems. It seems. Maybe they've fixed all of their problems by now uh, to make that happen. But it only takes one good one, right, for you to not be happy with how people are doing that. Uh, other questions. Um, when is the new material coming out for January? They just retired CompT in October. There is no new material. Uh, they retired an older version of the A plus in October, but they had already introduced the new material six months earlier in April of this year. So actually, we've had the new content since April. You'll notice my my course notes have been out since February. Um, no, since March. They came out just before the exam went live. So that's why um, there will be no new A-plus material in January. You have all of the A-plus content right now. If you are studying the 220-1101 or the 220-1102, you are studying the latest exams, and those are not planned to go away until 2025. you got three years, so you're good. There is no new content you have to wait for. Everything is already there and waiting for you. So that's, that's the idea. Uh, I want to thank uh, Razas I three Razas I three for for the name and for the uh, the th the five dollar super chat five dollar Canadian super chat. Thank you. Uh, they say passed my eleven oh one and eleven oh two with your resources, incredible videos onto Network Plus. Thank you for the help, sir. You are very welcome. Congratulations on your A plus, and I think Network Plus is a great certification to have. That knowledge you put in your pocket, you'll be able to use A-plus and Network Plus content, that knowledge you'll take with you your entire career. You will be using that information for everything you do in IT going forward, and that's why I support those certifications because of that. Having come from IT and worked through different manufacturers and worked through uh, operating systems, networking, cybersecurity, um, I know how much I use this content through the years, and I think it's valuable. If it wasn't, I wouldn't be making videos uh, that can help you work through all of that. Uh, other questions. Um, so, Professor Messer, have you ever done an exam at home? I have not for the reasons I mentioned earlier. I have a testing center that's minutes away from my house. Um, I've got other testing centers in town that I can go to that are 15 minutes away that are just exceptional testing centers. Uh, so I've not done one at home because of the, the problems with that. Plus, I'd have to do it at my desk. Uh, and one of the things they tell you when you're taking these exams, uh, you need one monitor and one keyboard. <laughs> so I can't do that at this desk. It's kind of hard to do an exam at home. Uh, with this setup. So I'd have to find somewhere else to do it. It just doesn't make sense for me. Other people, it probably makes a lot of sense um, and being able to do that. And as other people say here, they had a great experience taking their exam at home, and many people do. Other people, however, do not. Uh, the That's my problem is that people that go to a testing center never seem to have an issue. People take their exam at home, a certain percentage of those people do have issues. And so my my recommendation to you is to limit the number of problems by going to a testing center. I recognize that's not the best solution for everybody, however. So use the one that makes sense for you. Have all of that happen. And, and a good example, Eric says, anxiety, I'm with you. Like, if you're taking a test, I don't like it. Uh, taking it home would be the best. Then take it at home. Absolutely. Just be prepared for all of the nuances and little rules they have about can you have headphones? No, you cannot. Can you have a drink on your desk? I think they allow you a water in a clear glass now, although that doesn't make sense to have water near your computer. But any otherwise, uh, as long as you follow the rules and you know what the rules are, I think you'll be in, in better shape.
I think you'll you'll have no problem. Which means, you know, if you lean out a little bit and they say, hey, I can't see you on the screen, you go, oh, that's right. I need to stay. I'm with you. I got you. Okay, thanks. Um, and that, in fact, uh, Scott says, yeah, I got a, I, they were strict. I got a chat from them from being halfway out of the screen while reading. There, there you go. That's what I'm talking about. Uh, that would throw me a bit. Be like, wait, what? Wait, okay, now I got to get back into the exam again. You've now redirected me, and I have to get back into the other things that are there. Uh, find the one that works best for you. I think that's that's my recommendation as you step through these. Um, oh, this is a good one. I was forced to take off my leather wristband because they thought I was cheating off of it. Well, maybe you were. No, you weren't, but you could. You see how that works? They make you take off those things. You're almost disqualified, but they caught you and said, no, just take it off, put it over there, you'll be fine. Um, so it's not... It's not insurmountable that you run through these things. They made me take off my watch, Scott says. Yeah, that, that's, that's reasonable, I think. That's not an, I'm not too worried about those things. You just have to make sure you know about that beforehand. You take off all of those things. You make the environment so that you're not going to be in that situation uh, where they're working through those. Art says, hey, I just purchased study materials. I'm excited to get started, and we're excited to have you here. Uh, make sure you join our Discord so you can ask questions of us when we're not here live. Uh, it's a great way to... to get some ideas off other people. Sometimes at night, people will get together and do a live stream session on my Discord where they step through topics and questions and uh, have their own study information from people around the world, almost like what we're doing here, but you can do it yourself on our Discord at professormesser.com slash Discord. Thanks also for your support, Art, at uh, and getting those study materials. We really do appreciate it. Um, and a plus, this is for me, Scott. You're absolutely right. Uh, I had to do this before doing the live stream today. I had to clean the desk. It doesn't look like I cleaned the desk, but I did clean the desk. I've got things everywhere uh, on this desk. It's a it's, It can be a mess when it finally comes around, but that's another good thing that you're at least able to, uh, to clean up a little bit because you have to take pictures of where you're taking the exam and you have to send it to the proctor before you start everything. So that's that's completely up to you. So it's, did you vacuum? Should have vacuumed. Make Just go all the way. Dust. Get the vacuuming done. Okay, now we're ready to take the exam. We're in a good place. We're in a good headspace. We're in a good working environment. Let's go pass an exam. I think that's a great idea. Um, this is good. Uh, I took the test online, but on my campus in a private room. So maybe you can find a good environment. My environment won't work. Maybe if I'd gone to your campus... I'd be able to find a place where I could make that happen. There are people taking their exam in the bathroom because that's the only place they have where there's no technology that would get in the way. Probably not the best place to take an exam, but you got to do what you got to do, right? Uh, if that's where it is, then that's how, how it's working uh, and being able to have all of that happen. Uh, there's a lot of other questions that people have gone through. I like this one. Uh, having problems with my USB Wi-Fi dongle on an old computer. I installed Linux. Uh, what's a good resource for solving Linux OS problems? If there's, I think the number one problems that people have with Linux is that Wi-Fi. There's so many iffy drivers for Wi-Fi. Um, that's one of the probably one of the biggest issues that people run into is finding drivers for the hardware. In Linux, it's gotten a lot better recently. So if you're having problems with a particular Wi-Fi dongle or Wi-Fi adapter and it's not working out for you in Linux, I would recommend researching that driver in Linux, see if there's a different Linux distribution or a different driver that has already been written that you could add to your Linux distribution. Or ultimately, you may have to just get another Wi-Fi dongle. It just uh, doesn't work that way. Uh, you're not going to be able to find a driver, then you won't be able to find the Linux. Hey, is there a Linux course coming out soon? Well, that's a good question. Not, not from me. Not soon anyway. I have a big list of courses that I would like to create and produce. All of them take time, of course. Uh, Linux is in that list, but uh, the, the, the qualifier of soon, is there a Linux course coming out soon? Hmm, not really soon. Um, anyway, uh, will it ever happen? Maybe not ever. Uh, but no, no plans in the short term anyway to have Linux. Uh, if you buy a retake voucher, which technically you can only get from CompTIA, uh, you can't buy a retake voucher from my site. 
Um, can you use it on the 1102 if you pass the 1101? You cannot. Retake vouchers are only good to retake the same exact exam. So if you bought a voucher from the CompTIA website, and they cost a little more, you buy that retake voucher, you fail the first time, you can take exactly the same exam again with the retake voucher, but you cannot take a different exam with that re same retake voucher. So uh, in fact, it kind of works the other way. What if you take the 1101 and the first time through you pass? Well, then you bought a retake for no good reason. It's, it's your question. It's sort of an insurance policy, right? So you pay a little more, you pay a lot more, and you get this retake option. But do you really need it? My recommendation is just pass it the first time. Then you don't need a retake. You save some money. There's, there's a balancing act. But I get the reasoning for it. And if that's something that makes sense for you, maybe it's worth the extra money to work through those. Uh, do we need to purchase another voucher in the case that I fail the test the first time? Uh, we only have to purchase vouchers as we need them. I mean, these vouchers, I can turn a voucher around pretty quick. I often say that I can I set a 24-hour time frame, but usually if I'm here in the studio, I can get them out even faster than that. Usually at least twice a day, I'm, I'm pushing these vouchers out to folks who purchase them. Um, so you do need a voucher if you fail. You're going to need another voucher, or you would have hopefully purchased a voucher with a retake on it. Um, so, yeah, you'll need a separate voucher for each exam sitting that you go through. That's what that is. Uh, is about. Um, where and how can I check if there's a testing center near me? There is a link on the CompTIA website where you said, I'm ready to take my exam. And they send you over to the Pearson View website where you can look to see where in my area are different exam centers uh, and where they're located. Uh, it's all on the CompTIA website. Easy, easy, easy. And they give you quite a comprehensive list of where you can have uh, find one and where they, they will go. And that works for pretty much every country. Uh, I've, I've gone through different countries looking for testing centers, and I can find them all from there. Uh, another question from Edward says, uh, having an option to go for CCNA or Network Plus, which would you recommend? Well, these are two very different exams. They are not comparable to each other. As, as badly as the Internet would try to make you believe this, you, they're not interchangeable. You can't interchange Network Plus with CCNA. CCNA is not an interchange for Network Plus. They... They are two different exams. Uh, I would say Network Plus is an entry-level exam. I would say CCNA is sort of an intermediate, kind of a next level up from a difficulty-level perspective. Um, they do not contain the same information. They are very different in what you need to learn and what you need to know. And CCNA is obviously much more difficult because it is a higher-level, intermediate-level certification exam. Now, if you're trying to find a job, trying to find your very first job, and usually this is a help desk position, a technician position, something where you are break fix. You're, you're that person. Uh, CCNA may be too much. In fact, CCNA may overqualify you for a help desk position. What if you show up at your help desk and say, I am ready to take this help desk position, and look, I have my CCNA certification. Here you go. Well, an IT professional might look at that and go, oh, CCNA is way too much information for this entry-level help desk. You're going to be very bored after the first month of changing passwords, resetting accounts, doing kind of the lower level help desk things as you learn the ropes. And you already have a CCNA, you may want to look for a different job, maybe a position at a network operations center, a NOC might be a better fit. So getting a CCNA could potentially cause you not to get a job because you're overqualified. That is a real thing. Uh, whereas the Network Plus may be listed in the exam or in the uh, in the job posting. They may say, we want somebody with a Network Plus knowledge. Okay, Network Plus would be a better choice there. So as much as people on the Internet will tell you, well, just go get the CCNA, you'll, you'll get more money because those jobs will pay you more. Why are you getting a CCNA? Why don't you get the CCIE? That pays a lot more than the CCNA. Well, the reason you don't start at the very top is because you don't know the information you need to know to get there you have to start at the bottom and build the foundation. And uh, CCNA is one that is intermediate level. You Some people do jump right into CCNA, but it's going to take you a little bit longer because you don't have the network plus foundation to pull from. Uh, that's, your, that's your plus and minus, in my opinion, between both of those. Uh, let's have a look at other questions that have come in. Um, questions from Peter uh, with a $4.99 super chat. Thank you, Peter 
who asks, will the labs I purchased from you help me pass Security Plus exam if I'm more of a hands-on learner? I think they will. Uh, in fact, if you go to that page that has my Security Plus labs on it, I made a video of me using the labs. So you kind of get a feel for how does this work? What do I click on? What am I expecting to see on the screen? What is the process we can go through? Uh, they're very good labs. They are. Uh, there's a lot of nice user interface hooks in there that make it such a pleasure to use. You really don't lose yourself in these labs at all. They really guide you nicely through the process and even help you with some of the things where you have to type a lot. Um, I think they're very good labs. Otherwise, I would not have put them on my site. Um, and so I like them a lot. If you're looking for some good labs, CompTIA makes some exceptional labs for, for A+, plus, Network+, plus, and Security+. Plus. Um, and those are the ones I recommend for Security Plus as well. Uh, just good stuff on there. And there's a lot in those labs. They are big. Uh, I know they're, you know, you look at the price of the labs, they're over $100 to buy the labs, but they are comprehensive. They have a lot of information on these labs and multiple labs to go through. They have performance-based questions. They have hands-on questions. Uh, there's just, there's a lot there. Um, and they're better labs than I think I could ever create. So why not? Have a look at those. It's good stuff. Um, other questions. Um, oh, I like this one. Uh, someone made made them take the watch off. With only 20 minutes left, they realized and almost finished the exam. Oh, wait, you've got a watch on. Take that off, please. See, this is the interruptions you get when you're taking the exam at home. Um, if that doesn't bother you, then take your exam at home. I think it's fine. Um, <laughs> There's, there's some of you that I'm, I'm curious as if you were actually taking the right exam. They made you take your shirt off. Wait a, wait a second. That's not the CompTIA exam. That's, that's not the good. That's not the good one. Um, how often do I take a CompTIA test? Do you take one every now and then to QA my Q&As? I don't. Uh, I've taken so many of the CompTIA exams through the years. You realize I was taking CompTIA exams in the 600 series of the A+. So 601, 602, 701, 702, 801, 802, 901, 902, 1000, 1002. This is my sixth edition of A+, exams. I, I pretty much got it at this point. I don't really have to take any more tests from CompTIA to know what these tests are like. Uh, and I do a ton of information. I do a ton of research even if I don't take the exam, I do a ton of research to understand what type of questions really are being asked on the exam. Uh, there are ways to do that. And uh, because I didn't take the exam, I'm not held to the non-disclosure agreement um, in being able to work through that. So I don't any longer. But if, if they were to change the exam so that it was dramatically different than how it is today, I would, of course, would go take the exam so I could get a feel for it as well. Uh, makes perfect sense. Hey, Professor, when I show my back camera... I can't see your light. How do you get light to show on your face? What is, what's going on here? Is it magic? Well, it's sort of magic. It looks very dark here, doesn't it? it looks like super dark. Uh, you can't see it. Let me see if I can highlight it. But if you, if you look above, there is a, a pole coming. See that pole that's right there behind the monitor? And right up there, and you can kind of see there is a little bit of glare in that upper right-hand corner of the screen, like right here. Right there, see that? See that blur? There is a light that's right there, just out of the, out of the screen, just out of the frame, is a light. There's another one over here. You can't see it because I, I just don't have the camera up high enough, uh, to put it up there. But there are lights right here. There's also lights to my left and right. You can't see those either that are lighting the background, which is why the background is so well lit. But nothing here looks well lit because the lights are actually behind me. And that back there is probably, I don't know six, seven feet back, it's back there. So there's a lot of space there to light it up without lighting me up. So it's sort of an optical illusion, but that's real back there. That's a real, I can't, can I, left-handed? There you go, it was horrible. Um, but that's a real background back there. It's not a green screen. Didn't do very well. Um, I'm not a lefty, I'm a righty. Um, I, I, I can throw a ball, honest. No, really. Um, or in the South. Of course I can. Uh, there is others, questions that have come in. Let's do some other ones. I really should do a, an entire video of the studio so that everybody can really see what's going on. There is a picture. Let me see if I can find it real quick in my Instagram. 
uh, that does have a better picture of the studio. I'll see if I can find that. Oh, except I have to log in and we have to do all of that. Uh, we all know how that goes, don't we? Did I do uh, a login here? I think I did. So I'll scroll through and I'll show you a better picture of the studio from the other direction so that you can kind of see what in the world I've got going on there. I think that's probably the best way to do it um, and figure out the pieces of it. Uh, I, I've got more to go through. I have to find my profile. It's easier to search through if you're online. We'll just search through over here where you don't see it. And I'll answer more questions as I am doing that. A question that came in, uh, how long do I have to retake the exams if I have a voucher? Um, there's no delay on the retake. You just have to make sure you pass both of the exams that are in the same series. So right now, the series uh, in from April was the 220-1101 and the 220-1102. That's the two that you have to pass. You just have to make sure you get both of those passed before the entire exam series is retired, which at this point would be October of 2025. So that's plenty of time uh, if you have to retake anything uh, and being able to work through it. Uh, other questions? Um, I'll come back to this because I'm scrolling, scrolling, scrolling on here. Um, other pieces for this? Um, you said there are labs. For more information, where would I find that? You find it on my website under the recommended study materials. It's in the pull-down menus that are at the top of professormesser.com. That's what I would recommend. Uh, this is a pretty good one because I just went through this uh, on my exam, on my uh, A plus pieces. Is it worth setting up VMware to mess with BIOS settings if you're already familiar with gaming type motherboard BIOS settings? I guess corporate type PCs would have a legacy style BIOS. They might, but if you're already familiar with a BIOS, there's nothing more that you would need to do. And in fact, now it's even easier to work through BIOS because you should be able to do a the same emulator type that we saw for wireless routers. You could look, you could Google um, BIOS emulator, and there are tons of emulators out there for a BIOS configuration. You'll find tons of websites. Some of them are legit and not legit. The one that I was doing, which one was it? Um, maybe maybe BIOS simulator. Oh, yeah, the L Lenovo BIOS Simulator Center is a good one. They have one where you can go through and run different BIOS, but not from an actual computer, just as sort of a lab. Uh, and it'll, it'll take you through those. I think that's a good way to do it, working through all of those. I'm still scrolling through Instagram, by the way. I'm sure there's a search that would get me there faster. Uh, but right now, that's that's what we're working through. In fact, if you go and look at the BIOS videos on my A+, I used BIOS emulators to show that. So that's a really good example of how using a single BIOS online, I use that as if it was real on my system, and it worked great. So if, if you've done that, you've you probably got a feel for this. Okay, let's have a look at my studio from this view. Turn off this lower third. Um, so this is not a perfect perspective of it, but that's pretty good. Anyway, this is the view from behind the camera. Really, the camera's sitting here. It's a different camera now. This is from a number of years ago. So you can see there are lights that are right here. Um, I have different lights now, but that's where they are. And they kind of light up everything behind here. Uh, you don't even get to see most of this. You know, there's there's shelves up here and information. There's stuff on top of the the fireplace. You don't even get to see those. Um, you really get to see it from the other perspective. But that's effectively what I'm running now. I mean, that's that's sort of it. I have more monitors here now. I added a couple. <laughs> we need, can't have enough monitors, right? Uh, so that's that's the the view of it, uh, and that's why it sort of looks like I I don't have lights here, but I totally have lights here. That's that's where those come from. Um, other questions. Um, this is one that asks, 
I have a bachelor's degree, but no certification. And I want to go into uh, get into a certification. What certification should I start with? Well, this now becomes more of a question about what you want to do and what opportunities are available for you in your particular area. There's, there's no way for me to tell you, oh, you should go take this cert. Oh, you should go take this cert. Maybe you should take that cert. There's just no way for me to tell you because I don't know what employers in your area, in your country, in your city or state, I don't know what they're asking for. All the, if you're for, let me give you an example. So uh, let's say you live in Maryland or Virginia or somewhere in the D.C. area. If you go look at IT jobs in that area, you'll notice a huge number of the IT jobs want you to have Security Plus because one of the, the minimum entry-level certs for federal government, well, specifically DOD, but it sort of leaks into the rest of federal government, is they want you to have a Security Plus cert. They don't want you to have Network Plus. They don't care about the A+. Plus. They care about you having a Security Plus. So if you were in that area and you were looking for one of those jobs, I would tell you to go get Security Plus. But maybe you live in Dallas. And in Dallas, it's a completely different makeup of companies. It's a completely different group of companies. And I would recommend that you look to see what they're asking for. You may find that all of those jobs would like you to have an A+. Or maybe they want you to have Network Plus. Maybe they want you to have a Microsoft certification. Maybe they want you to have a Linux certification. Maybe they want you to have a CCNA. I don't know. But I can't recommend a specific cert until I know your goals and objectives and what employers would like you to have. You know, those two things sort of go together in many ways. Sometimes they don't. If you just want a job and money, just go get whatever they want you to have doesn't matter what, what you want. It matters what they want. It uh, doesn't matter what I want. It matters what they want. And so that's what I would recommend is if you want to add more to your resume than just your bachelor's of science or your AA degree or whatever you have, then go get a certification that people want you to have. What are they asking for? It doesn't work the other way. I mean, you can't just go get a bunch of certs and go, well, I got a bunch of certs. You should hire me. The employer will go, well, we don't. We don't care about those certs. Those aren't the ones we're hiring people for. We're hiring people for these certs. That's why I tell people you have to kind of turn the question around and say, what do employers in my area want me to have? That's the certification you should go after. And I do have a, uh, a cert that or, or a, a video on how to get a job in IT with no experience. It's in the YouTube video description of this video. And that link takes you to a 30-minute video. I know it's long, but it's, it's, it's chock full. There is no slack in there whatsoever um, where I go through all of the different things that employers would like you to have and some different strategies for choosing the right certification for the right scenario. Um, and I break them all down in detail because this is obviously a common question. I think that video is, I highly recommend you watch that video. It has a lot of good tips, a lot of good tricks, a lot of good things that you can think about to come up with a strategy that you can use to get that next job, get a first job or get a better job. Um, that's the goal. And, and it's really a strategy. It's really something where you just can't throw a certification at the wall and hope it sticks. You have to go about it in a little bit more strategic way, in a little bit more intelligent way to figure out how can I be better than everyone else going for this job? Because that's what you need to do. You just have to be better than all of them. And so there are different ways to make yourself better. Uh, there's labs you can set up at home. There's things that you could study for. There are, uh, you already have the formal degree in your pocket. So there's already, you're already ahead of the game. There's just little things that you can add on to make it even better. So I recommend adding on and making things even better to be able to make that happen. Um, hi, Prof. If I set a date to take the 2-20-1101 in January, how many times can I reschedule it? And will the coupon be expired in this case? You can continue to reschedule your exam with 48 hours notice until you hit the expiration of your voucher. So if you buy the voucher today, this is December the something. What is this? The 6th? December the 6th. Um, you can keep 
going in every two days and rescheduling your exam every two days for a year. But you can't go past December the 6th of next year. You have to take the exam before the voucher date it reaches that expiration. So that's the important part. It's the date on the voucher that is the difference. You can change your scheduling. You can reschedule the exam as long as you get 48 hours of notice. You can do it all online. You don't have to call anybody. Just go online. Oh, I got three days. Let's push it another week. I'm just not ready. And you can push it a week. And then two, or two days before that, you may decide, oh, I need one more week. You can push it again. You can keep pushing it until you hit the expiration date of your voucher. That's, that's your number. That's the thing that's important on uh, having that there. Um, once you get the first part in, there's no limit until expiration of the series to get the second one done. That is correct. So if you passed your first exam today, you have to pass the second exam sometime before October of 2025. So you got three years before or so before the exam series is retired. Just make sure you get the second exam passed within that three-year time frame. It was a little bit different at the beginning of this year. Our exam was, that series was retired in October. So imagine if you took your first exam in July and passed it, you would only have August, September, and October to pass the second exam. For some people, they took the first exam and they weren't able to take the second exam before October 20th, which means they had to start completely over again with the new series. Not a great situation. So that's why I tell people, don't be in that situation either. You want to absolutely nuke everything that people are doing on this certification. Just, just cover the bases. Make sure that nobody is is in your way to get that second exam done because it's so important to make that happen. And the other people are saying, yeah, that's what I did. I, I took the first one. I wasn't able to get the second one done in time. And now we have to restart the process. That's not where you, that's not the best situation. However, you know, even though you have to restart the process, the difference between exams is only about 30% new content. So the, the silver lining, if you will, of that is that you don't have to start all the way over at the beginning. You just have to learn the things that are new. And then you can, can pass that exam. So it's not an enormous undertaking, but there's still some extra studying you're going to have to do to be able to get back in there again. It's unfortunate. There's, you know, there's a financial cost of that. There's your time. There's your, your brain power. You know, there's only so much brain power I have to go towards and support that particular issue. So that's why I tell people, uh, get it all done. Have a plan. Make sure you, you know the time frames. Make sure you know when the exam series retires, and you'll be fine. And you'll know what to do with it. Um, we can probably take this one as we work through it. Would having these certifications be a precursor for a coding career? Generally speaking, no, they would not be. And I mentioned this earlier sort of as a sort of a, an, an, uh, something in an uh, that I said that was sort of different to this, but let me let me see if I can find the details of my uh, how to get a job in IT um, with no experience. I've got to find uh, the right connection. I've got to find the right uh, file that's on my system because there was a great graphic at the very beginning of that that kind of told the story of how that works. I'm not sure I can really find this in the proper amount of time. I may just have to go to the um, to the ones I have. No, I found it. Uh, I found it. Had a good job in IT with no experience. There it is. Let's bring up the graphic. Let's load it up. Here we go, everybody. Uh, and this is probably the thing that I get a lot of questions about. But these are, this in, in the very broadly speaking, and this is a very broad explanation of this, here is, let me put me in here. Uh, these are, this is how I qualify or demonstrate the differences between information technology and computer science. And, and very broadly, information technology is operating systems, networking, security, your data, keeping everything running, deploying patches, making sure the applications are running properly, um, making sure the company is able to deploy new technologies. That's all information technology. 
computer science tends to focus on the code that is running in these systems. They are creating applications that are running in these systems. They are building hardware and firmware that runs that hardware. That's computer science. So whenever I hear someone say programming, I immediately think programming is writing and building applications. That's computer science. IT is all about A plus network plus security plus and all the other things that I just mentioned. But notice there's very little overlap, almost no overlap between those two. Now, technically speaking, and this is where you're a completely realistic and fair uh, complaint about that, is that, wait a second, in IT, we do programming. We write tons of scripts. We write tons of automation. We do lots of things that deal with programming. Well, to, to be fair, that's absolutely true. But I think calling that programming is a little bit of an overreach, and it kind of doesn't allow us to make a comparison between the two. So I say programming is when you're building an application. You're building a mobile app for your phone. You're building an app for the web. You're building hardware and firmware. That's programming. You're working with a programming language. You're working with C++. You're working with a, a high-end programming language that's going to build an application. You're compiling things. You're, you've got uh, gits and dips and all kinds of things you have to deal with on that side and, and versioning. On IT side, you're not building applications. You're not working with C++. But you are doing automation. You are building scripts. You're building a lot of scripts. Anytime you can automate, you automate. So that is why I tell people programming is a different group of people doing a different thing in a different area of the company in a different section of managers, probably in a different, they might be underneath the entire IT management, but it's not IT, it's programming, it's computer science. On the other side, the IT side is what we're talking about here. It's understanding operating systems, understanding the protocols going across the network, keeping things secure, understanding firewalls, working with security systems. That's what we talk about in IT. And so there's, there's not a lot of overlap and certifications that you might get on the IT side really don't apply to the programming side. In fact, programming doesn't have a lot of certs. With programming, you kind of show your knowledge by the programming you write, by the code you write. And you can show somebody, here's some code I did. And they go, oh, okay. Here's, a, here's an application I wrote. Oh, that, I can see that application. You don't need an extra cert to show that you wrote an app. You just show the app, and you're good. Um, and so that's why I tell people, don't mix those two. I have a lot of people, in fact, if you, <laughs> I've said before, in there are many organizations, I, I think uh, universities especially, that either don't have a good IT program or their IT program is really a bunch of programming. Like they don't, even the, even the universities don't understand what IT happens to be. Uh, I don't know why. Some, of, some are really good IT programs. Others are not. Um, in fact, I just walked through in a recent study group. We looked at a university here in Florida that has an IT program. And when you look at it, like, oh, look, you, you learn about operating systems. Great. You learn about networking. Fantastic. Here's a piece about security. Great. And physics. What? Yeah, you have to pass a physics class to get your IT degree. This is where it all goes off the rails. Why are we having to learn physics? Oh, because you use physics when you do programming. Yeah, but we don't do programming. <laughs> We're in IT. It's an IT program. You're getting an IT degree. Yeah, but you got no physics. It makes no sense uh, at all. When I was in school, I got a degree in management and business. I had to take calculus. How much calculus are we doing in business? None. We're not doing any. Did I have to take class? Yes. Twice. So that's, that's the problem is that even universities don't quite get it right. There's not a lot of places out there that are purists when it comes to IT and purists when it comes to uh, computer science. There just isn't. I don't know why. I do know why. I'm just not going to say why. Uh, I, th I think they like putting up barriers. I think especially colleges and universities, they love to put up walls. They love to gatekeep for whatever reason. I think it makes them feel like they're better if they make it harder. But in that particular case, it's worthless. It's a waste of time. And so, I, you know, there's, there are great things about universities. 
and great things that you can learn from universities and you build great relationships with the people at the university that you're in class with. Um, but they don't always get it right when it comes to IT. They're very good at computer science. Practically every computer science curriculum I've looked at has been spot on for programmers. But almost every IT program I've ever looked at at a university goes pretty well and then suddenly diverts over into something that has nothing to do with IT. And I don't know why they keep doing that. It doesn't make any sense at all. Um, but that's the way universities work, I guess. Um, and we'll we'll kind of finish up with this question, which asks, how does CompTIA A+, plus, Network+, plus, and Security+, plus compare to typical undergraduate degrees? Uh, they don't. A undergraduate degree, an AA degree, a formal formal education, we will call it, is not the same thing as a certification. And a certification is not the same thing as a formal degree. Those are different things. They bring a different knowledge tool set, if you will, to the table. And they are not designed to replace each other. So you can't take a certain number of certs and say you have a comparable number of degrees that you've just got. And you can't get a degree and say, well, that's a comparable set of certifications. It doesn't work that way. And I will refer you back to my how to get a job in IT with no experience video because I go through this in that video for that very reason. They are not the same thing. They do not have the same uh, the same approach. They don't bring the same thing to the table that the other does. And so I often tell people, you have to have both. You can't just have one of them, and you can't swap one for the other. You need to have both of those and, and really work through uh, understanding why they are valuable for what they do by themselves. So, yes, you should have both a formal degree and certifications, and neither of those replaces the other. And I would not recommend that you try to do that either because it doesn't. Uh, it's not going not gonna to work that way. Uh, and I think that's probably uh, the best, the best uh, approach to both of these. So the, the last, last question, just so we're clear, when is the 2-2011-01 going to get phased out? October, we estimate that a reasonable retirement date will be October of 2025. October of 2025. So that's, that's what we're doing. That's that is when you should expect these to go, which means as we sit here in 2022, you got a pretty good ramp. You got a very good ramp. It usually takes people on average two to three months to study for a single A plus exam, which means you can probably finish up your studies in about four to six months for both exams. And that's that's an average. You might do better. You might take more time. That's up to you. So that's why I tell people you got plenty of time to get both of these done by October of 2025. You have about three years, just under three years to make this happen. I think you've got plenty of time. Come back in January. We'll we'll talk more about that on the 1101. Or even better, we're doing this same study group in two days. In Thursday, I'm going to do an 1102 study group. I've already written the questions. They're already ready to go. And we'll, of course, have the after show, too, where you can ask questions on the after show and we can step through all of those. But we have we have run out of time. We have hit our limit. I want to thank you for being here in that first hour. Thank you for being here in the second hour for the after show. We got lots more to do on Thursday. We'd love for you to come back. In the meantime, meet us over on Discord. We're hanging out there. Go to professormesser.com slash Discord. We thank you for being here. We will see you next time on the A-plus study group. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>